Hello friends. Welcome to the Muse fanfiction. How are you all? So in this video, we will see what if Naruto became the sworn dragon master of Westeros. But before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video with your friends. Now without wasting any more time, let's begin the story. Hell and Brimstone had shattered Valyria forever. The fourteen flames, volcanoes that encompassed the Valyrian peninsula, unleashed its wrath upon the world like angry gods, devouring civilization with the most malicious inferno. All the death and suffering were wrought by the heresy of awakening one man. 7 Ing Hell. Naruto glanced up, his sapphire eyes feast upon the vault of darkness that painted the sky. Streaks of white tore the heavens asunder threatening to bring thunderstorm and chaos upon Valyria. I am supposed to be entombed beneath the world for eternity. It was the only way for me to end my immortality, but those, humans have taken that from me. Hatred and fire blazed across Naruto's eyes as he stood atop the tallest of the burning mountains, snarling at the whole of Essos. With a mere flick of his wrist, the apocalypse had ended. Molten flames no longer spew from the unforgiving volcanoes, the earthquakes that devastated Valyria had gone eerily silent, and the blanket of black smoke that blotted out the sun had parted ways for flicker of lights to invade. The dragons that had survived the cataclysm swooped down before Naruto, lowering their great snouts as if to swear their fealty to their new master. Mankind has used you to plunder and conquer for millenniums, but that is over now. From this day forth, you shall dominate the sky and answer to no one, but me. From the ashes beneath, a terrible force stirred. The horde of dragons trembled in trepidation as a monstrosity emerged. Rivulets of fiery magma were running underneath the golden scales of this primordial colossus. An unholy roar, so horrifying and untamed, thundered across acres of charred earth, causing even the sea to swell with its angriest waves and the land to shake. A three-headed dragon erupted into the world, bringing forth untold destruction in its wake. Its size towered over other dragons, cementing itself as Mother Nature's most fearsome weapon. Naruto turned to the mighty dragon, a poignant smile curled at his lips as he raised his hand. It has been a while, mother of the dragons, Ghidorah. Ghidorah crooned softly to Naruto's touches, almost as if it was greeting an old friend. This world is still not ready for us yet, Ghidorah. Let us rebuild this land, together, we will make a better one. A keep for the dragons. It was then the legend of the Dragon Warden was born. X. O. X. O. X. House Targaryen had prospered under Aegon Targaryen's reign. As the old saying goes, behind every great man is an even greater woman. That was very much true as Visenya Targaryen the Indomitable was his most feared general. Bards would sing tales about Visenya's unrivaled combat prowess and the terror that her dragon, Bogar, would bring decimating any foes who refused to bend their knees before her. If the gods had a vision for the pinnacle of beauty, then Visenya would be their masterpiece. She had a peerless beauty that was haunting and almost otherworldly. Her hair was a glorious tumble of platinum, her eyes sparkled an authoritative violet, and her voluptuous figure was the envy of many. Visenya was as deadly as she was beautiful. Politics however bored Visenya, nothing could give her as much exhilaration as when she was in the heart of battle. War, triumph, and blood gave her purpose, they made her whole and allowed her to truly feel alive. If she wasn't letting her blood drunk rage take her, she could be found in the outskirt of Dragonstone, scrubbing and cleaning the grimes off her beloved dragon's skin. No one understands me more than you, Vogger. Basenya giggled when Vogger shook the water off its body. Congratulations, sister. I heard father has decided to marry you to our brother. Rainey's Targaryen ambled out of hiding with jaunty strides, smiling like a seductress. A warrior Rainey's was not, but what she lacked in the art of swordplay, she more than made up for her shrewdness. You shall be queen when we finally unite Westeros under our hegemony. If that is my duty, then so be it. Visenya dismissed it coldly. The Targaryens had a peculiar fondness for inbreeding, something that repulsed Visenya to her core. Sure, she loved her brother, but not in that way. Nevertheless, she had no say in it, for her father's decree was absolute. You don't seem to be thrilled about it. A sly grin played about Rainey's full lips. Many women would die just to sleep with our brother, yet you deign to the idea. Why is that? Do you think it was sacrilege? Visenya rolled her eyes. 
It is none of your concern, sister. As the princess of House Targaryen, it is my destiny to wed my brother. Rhaenys discerned the disgust and malice from her sister's tone, which all the more made her want to tease her sister. Ah, as expected of the firstborn. The indomitable, always serious and never slacking. You're going to get wrinkles soon if you frown like that all the time. The only time Visenya could be seen smiling was when her flawless face was caked in blood. Rhaenys had to resist shuddering when she recalled the maniac look on Visenya's face whenever they were in the battlefield. If you're here to be the messenger, then you have done your part. Visenya's gaze was fixated at Vogger and she picked up her cleaning cloth. I am in the middle of giving Vogger a bath, please leave us be. Oh, but I haven't even delivered my message yet, sister. Rhaenys grinned. Say, have you heard about the dragon warden? Visenya scoffed and wiped Vogger's wings with tender care. That's just a myth. Old Valyria is no more. Some drunk sailors must have mistaken the ruins for something else. Clicking her tongue in disagreement, Rhaenys folded her arms. The sighting of dragons roaming the sky is still very much prevalent amongst sailors who dare venture near Old Valyria. And let's not forget about the fall of the Lion King, Tom and Lannister who brought his golden fleet into the smoking sea and were never seen again. Our brother wishes to dash the rumors once and for all. At that, Visenya raised a brow. Aegon wants to arrange an expedition to old Valyria? For some ludicrous rumors? Why? Rhaenys shrugged. He has his reasons. You were chosen to accompany him there while I remain here in Dragonstone, guarding it with Merrix's. You should get ready. He is setting off when the dawn cracks. Good luck. Visenya didn't pay much attention to her sister leaving. A maelstrom of thoughts were running rampant in her mind. Why would Aegon want to validate those rumors? Old Valyria fell when the fourteen fires awakened, a story that was very much ubiquitous and unchallenged. And then there was the story about a caretaker of some sort who held supremacy over many dragons, most which didn't perish in the calamity. In the end, those stories should be taken with a pinch of salt. X. O. X. Oh! Ex Aegon Targaryen fastened the saddle over his dragon, Valerian. Before he turned to his most trusted aide, Visenya. You ready? As I'll ever be. Visenya's expression betrayed no emotion as she climbed over Vogger. Let's get this over with. It wasn't much of a secret that Visenya relished in battles and anything else was just a drag to her. War was ingrained into her when she was a mere child and Aegon couldn't blame her for being an enigma. Despite their relationship being distant at best, Aegon truly admired his sister, for she was the personification of their house's motto, fire and blood. Visenya took flight with Aegon following closely behind. The trip to old Valyria would take them an hour tops with Vogger and Valerian. Crossing the narrow sea wasn't the obstacle though, it was navigating through the smoking sea that perturbed them. Those who had the gall to dwell deep within the treacherous fog never made it out alive. The lucky ones either returned mad or whispered some cock and bull stories about a three headed serpent that guarded the ruins. Visenya snorted. If this creature did exist, then Visenya would behead it and bring its worthless carcass back as trophy. Aegon spotted his sister chuckling darkly to herself and chose not to interrupt. Only the gods knew what kind of crazy was running inside Visenya's mind. When they bypassed the smoking sea, they were taken aback by what had become of old Valyria. The riot of virescent green and sunburned orange filled the lands, and the breeze of autumn enveloped them. The mackerel sky invited lances of sunlight into the forest bed, as if enchanting the terrain with its warmth. Visenya couldn't help but be awed by the great stream of the vast woodland that sparkled like diamonds. Was this, a paradise? Her thoughts were disrupted when she heard a faint howl. It wasn't the wind, she mused. When realization dawned on Visenya, she gasped. It was the cry of a dragon. Could it be that the rumors were true after all? Old Valyria wasn't completely vanquished. She looked behind her shoulder and raised her fist at her brother, signaling him to descend. Swiftly, Vagar and Valerian glided down upon a meadow. The ever eager Visenya dropped down to her feet and took in her surroundings. Stunning, it was what she could surmise. Aegon stood beside his sister and eyed the trees. Valyria is still alive, after all. One would think that this place should be a barren wasteland, but this, this is good news. We can migrate here and establish a home to honor our ancestors. No, you won't. Visenya and Aegon felt their blood chilled. 
They spun around and was caught off guard by the intrusion of a hooded man, whose luminous eyes under the shadow were as cold as winter. Even Vagar and Valerian didn't sense his presence. They let out an ear-shattering roar at the unfazed man, who seemed to be more annoyed than intimidated. Most dragons address me with respect, hatchlings. No matter how exigent or ghastly the situation might be, Vagar and Valerian were dauntless, even in strife. So, when the dragons whimpered and cowered hastily behind their masters, Visanya and Aegon's jaws dropped. Mortals wouldn't be able to perceive the man's real form, but dragons could. What Vagar and Valerian saw made them swallow down a bile of fear and they involuntarily took a step back. It was a nightmare turned reality. An unfathomable beast, transcendental and nefarious at the same time, stared down at them like they were protozoa, its nine tails were swinging hypnotically. Each one of them could easily level an island, and its sharp teeth could lacerate even the sturdiest of steel. Visenya was confused. Who the is this man? Why is Vagar so fearful of him? And why the hell did he sound like a father scolding his children? She was Vagar's mother, not this scoundrel, who gave him the rights. Gritting her teeth, she was the first to regain her bearing and unsheathed her sword. Dark sister. State your name, fiend. What are you? Visenya's outburst only made Vagar more jittery and restless. It nudged its mistress's porcelain face, desperately urging her not to provoke the man before them. Astonished by Vagar's anxiousness, she patted her dragon's snout, trying to ease down its fear. Don't fret, my dear. She turned to the man and steeled her glare. I demand that you. You demand nothing of me. The man sneered. Vagar and Valerian flinched on instinct. This kingdom is mine and mine alone. Aegon took a bold step forward, his jaw clenched. We have every right to claim this land. Our ancestors lived here once before. They were the Dragonlords. Dragonlords. A cruel chortle escaped the man's lips, his voice though sweet and mocking, held an edge. If I claim to be the king of this land, will you bend your knees? No you wouldn't. Those are just titles. Meaningless. Visenya was bedacious to point her sword at the monster in a man's skin, who ruled perdition and commanded dragons through fear. In the name of all that is righteous and just, I, Visenya Targaryen, first of my name, Lady of Dragonstone, and Dragonlord of Westeros, hereby sentence you to death. You, sentence me to death? The man removed his hood, startling Aegon and Visenya. His tone took a surprising 180, becoming gleeful and almost innocent. That just tickles my funny bone. How could someone so beautiful and insurmountable be murderous at the same time? His strong jaw and comely features were the fantasy of maidens, but Visenya wasn't going to be captivated by his sunglow hair nor his ocean blue eyes. No, she had a goal, annihilate this man and lay claim of this realm. Letting out a war cry, Visenya charged forward, her sword reared. Your asinine intent is laughable. Just as Visenya was about to cleave the man in half, his hand shot out and grasped the sharp edge of Dark Sister, halting her strike instantly. Visenya's eyes widened like saucer, unable to register what she was seeing. You're a daft cunt if you think you can kill me with a sword. Petrified, Visenya tried to free her sword from the man's grip, but she couldn't even muster any strength to shake it off. W what? And then he started mumbling, incoherent, heinous and most likely inaudible to Aegon, but it was clear as day to Visenya. I claim the corrupt, seek the evil, and spill thy blood who kill and rape. A sword with the color of the night materialized into his grasp, his eyes flashed a demonic red. The filth who cross into the purest form of corruption shall reap it when I send thou back to thy maker. Thee shall repent for thy sins, by fire and blood. What are you spluttering? Visenya growled. I am Naruto, the warden of this dragon's keep. He released his hold over Visenya's sword and raised his instead. Tremors wrecked the lands, tremendous pressure smashed down on the Targaryen siblings, and Vagar and Valerian sniveled. Make peace with your demons, for your end is nigh. Cackling with mad mirth, Visenya bolted towards Naruto. What was these exuberance and terror coursing through her veins? It was pleasure of the highest order, a sensation that made her felt complete. Yes, this was what she had been seeking for her entire life. A worthy opponent, she wanted nothing more than to bifurcate this man with dark sister and bathe in his blood. Shut up and show me what you got fiend. Their clash would burn into Aegon's memories for years to come. 
it was without a doubt that Visenya was a freak of nature whose paramount skills with the sword was unmatched. Not even Aegon could best his sister. To see someone who could toy with Visenya as if she was nothing more than a petulant child was, frightening to imagine. Visenya was unyielding though, smashing and slashing her way to exploit an opening. Naruto parried her brutal onslaught with a smug grin tugged at his face, his eyes appraising her like a hawk. A fine specimen indeed, sparks and flames burst out when their swords clanged against each other once more. Not bad for a girl playing dress up. Incandescent fury lit up in Visenya's eyes, but it soon morphed into disbelief as her blade shivered under the cruel might of his strength. You dare underestimate me? I respect a woman with conviction, no matter how foolish she may be. A storm was brewing from the cold horizon. With no warning, a legion of ferocious dragons plummeted from the atmosphere, their roars could drown out even the loudest battle drums. Vogger and Valerian quavered in consternation. The dragons that encircled them were bigger, in every sense of the word. Now tell me, Visenya Targaryen, why will a man give his all to fight a mere child? Visenya almost exploded in umbrage when Naruto's sword took shape of a cane. You will humiliate me. Naruto grinned as if he had already won their battle, I will humble you. Blood pumping, heart pounding, Visenya saw red before she swung her sword with no grace and gravitas whatsoever. There was only vengeance and the desire to annihilate the man who dared belittle her. Naruto sidestepped her haphazard strikes and smacked her wrist with his black cane, earning him an uncharacteristic yelp from the Targaryen warrior. Never thought you're capable of making that sound. Visenya ground her teeth seething at the mockery i refuse to stand for this sister please silence visenya almost screamed at her brother i will have his head on a pike naruto sucked in air and then a bone shuddering grin curled at his lips don't use such strong words it will look like you're jesting with me a tense silence intruded neither of them moved what's the matter girl your legs are trembling and then visenya lunged at naruto her eyes murderous. Sword and cane met once more, the grin of madness were found on both of their faces. The mischief in Naruto's face turned into sobriety, his voice deep and rich. Your arrogance has blinded you. You think it is your birthright to rule this world? No you know nothing. At least we're trying to make it a peaceful one. Naruto snorted. By pillaging and burning countless others? By uniting Westeros under one house? Do you even have any idea what it was like in Westeros before our house came? Anarchy? Chaos? The whore enslaves the Tully. The gardener never cared if their people were suffering in poverty. The Lannister would do anything, no matter how depraved it is, if it is for the sake of wealth and gold. Seven houses squabbling over petty vendettas while the poor suffer. But we came. And we changed that. Wagging a finger at Visenya, Naruto shook his head. Do not disguise your conquest with a cloak of good intention. You didn't conquer Westeros because you have to. You did it because you could. Visenya's angelic face contorted into a snarl. If we can swallow the whole of Westeros, then it wouldn't be much to dispose you. You are in over your head on this one, girl. No fear in the face of death. The thought of surrender didn't even cross Visenya's mind. Some might mistook Visenya's unwavering fortitude for stupidity, but she always had an allergy for cowardice. She knew in her hearts of hearts that this man was no man, and that he saw God's creations as beneath him, but she didn't care. She thrived in adversity. Her next strike, however, would determine the outcome of her battle. Naruto beckoned with his finger at Visenya, a wicked grin played about his lips. You said you were a dragonlord, no? Let me put that name to the test. Visenya charged one last time, her sword held high in the air. Everything happened too fast for Aegon to comprehend. One moment Visenya was darting towards Naruto with all her fury and valor. In a blink of an eye, her sword flew away from her hand and she was on her knees, at the very mercy of the man and his cane. Yield, he said. She lifted her chin, eyes blazing with defiance. Good. Any more so-called lessons of humility will be gratuitous. Visenya had proved her worth. In time, with the right cultivation, she would become formidable, a force to be reckoned with, a dragonlord worthy of her name. Naruto turned his attention to Aegon, his face darkened. You have barged into forbidden lands and threatened me with death. On any given day, I will have torn your body apart with my bare hands and feed whatever that is left of you to my dragons, 
but I am nothing but generous. When you leave here today, tell them. Let every man, woman, and child in Westeros know what happened. This dragon's keep shall remain undisturbed for centuries to come. And if any brave man wish to incur my wrath, then know this. The dragons aren't the alpha predator in the ecosystem. I am. If it wasn't for his strong will, Aegon would have fallen to his knees. What is to become of my sister? She shall remain here, serving me, from this day till her last day. Visenya didn't oppose it, she had lost, her life forfeited to the man who had made her bend her knee. If servitude she must give, then servitude she would give. I pledge my allegiance to you. My sword is yours, now and always. Pleased. Naruto gave Aegon one last smile. A dangerous gleam flashed across his eyes. I know you will use your dragon to rule Westeros. And I have no doubt that you will succeed. But heed my warning. If you and the kings after you were to abuse the powers of the dragons, I will sail the narrow sea and exterminate your kin. That is my promise to you. Believe it. X. O. X. O. X. If it wasn't for the breathtaking expanse of lush grass and the sweetness of daisies lingering in the air, Visenya would have pulled out her hair in frustration. They had gallivanted around the field for an hour and Visenya had an epiphany that they were lost. Where are you taking me? Do you know what your job entails? Visenya shrugged. Serving you? Changing your chamber pots? Hunt food for you? Warm your bed if you desire? Naruto cocked a brow. Visenya mentioned the last point as if talking about the weather. A hollow chuckle escaped his lips as they ventured towards the woods. You will not be doing any of that. In Dragon's Keep, it is my duty to take care of the dragons. Now, it is yours too. Speaking of which, Visenya wasn't sure how many dragons existed. As a child, she was told that the dragons lurking in Old Valyria were eradicated during the doom. Now, the truth had unraveled before her and she couldn't help but feel excited about it. Imagine the possibility of raising not one, not two, but a hundred of them. Westeros, nay, the whole world would tremble beneath the shadow of their wings. As she tilted her chin and faced the jewel blue sky, she couldn't help but smiled at Vogger flying alongside with other dragons, singing and playing, almost like they were free spirited children of the heavens. Say, I've been meaning to ask, what happened to old Valyria? Did the doom really happen? Visenya caught a glimpse of Naruto's eyelid twitching rather violently. Yes, unfortunately it did. The highborn of Valyria were foolish enough to herald their ends, by awakening me. It is their greed that ushers their day of reckoning. The Red Sea. The fiery sky. The genocide. A civilization, wiped out because they wanted a weapon of destruction to serve them. Now, they are ashes. To think that Naruto's awakening turned the greatest city in history into history. Visenya wasn't sure if she should be marveled, shit her pants, or do both at the same time. How do you want me to take care of your dragons? Forgive me for my ignorance, but dragons only accept one master at a time. Is this not their nature? Abruptly, a black blur dove down and smashed right into Naruto, mortifying Visenya. She hastily pulled out her sword, beads of sweat forming profusely on her temples. It was a dragon with scarred scales that glistened like obsidian, its nostrils blowing wisps of smoke, and eyes glowing a dreadful red. Menacing and monstrous, Visenya knew Vagar would not outfight this one. Naruto was done for, so she thought. It wasn't every day that Visenya got the chance to see a man wrestling with a dragon, very much like roughhousing with a dog in a park. There were no words to express how staggered she was. Naruto was laughing aloud playing with the dragon on the sodden earth without a care in the world. This is Alduin. He is the beta in the pack. Visenya cocked a brow. So, who's the alpha? Naruto grinned. You're looking at him. A chill crawled up Visenya's spine. There was something alluring about this man. Perhaps it was his devilishly good looks or his spellbinding eyes that could bewitch those under his powerful gaze. But Visenya had never felt her heart beating faster for any man, and she had met many. Pushing down her lewd thoughts, she regained her composure. Dragons only accept those they deem strong. That is their true nature. Naruto petted Alduin, which was nuzzling his shoulder. Weakness disgusts them. To be accepted by a dragon is to be acknowledged for your strength. If you want to fulfill your duty as a dragon warden, you need to prove your worth to them. You have done so with your dragon. Now, you need to garner all of their respect. Placing a hand on her curvaceous hip, Visenya probed, 
her eyes wandered to the imposing yet majestic black dragon. I am under the impression that I am here to serve you. Naruto waved a dismissive hand. To serve me is to serve the dragon's keep. Your ancestors and their ancestors before were meant to keep the dragons from being captured and used by avaricious men. It was their sworn duty to protect the dragons, something they failed to uphold in the end. Now, I have returned. And I have to clean up their mess. Visenya surveyed the tall oaks around her and felt an anomaly, a tingling sense, almost like a prick on her skin, when she gazed deep into the bowel of the forest. It connected her to something surreal, allowing her to sense the vitality of nature. I have seen you done things that are beyond humans' reach. Is it possible to attain this power? It is in you. Gesturing Alduin to leave them, Naruto climbed to his feet and watched as his dragon ascended to the sky. Different religions and cultures call it by different names. Your people call it, magic. Magic? That got Visenya's full attention. So, you're saying that my family can bond with dragons because we have magic, inside us? Untapped potential, really. Most of your kin in the past could draw it out. Gave magic a functionality, if you may. Naruto strolled towards his destination. Vizanya, who was still coming to terms with the revelation, realized that she was left behind and briskly caught up with her master. Have you heard about the Shadow Lands? Brushing a lock of hair behind her ear, Visenya nodded. The land of myths. Legend has it that demons and magic ruled that place. Naruto chuckled. I hailed from the Shadow Lands. In your tongue, it would be known as the Elemental Nations. Why is it called so? because its people could bend the elements to their biddings. I have seen men who could bring down the moon. I have seen women who could lift mountains. What you believe to be impossible, they made it possible. And where are they now? Dead. The sadness in his voice didn't go unnoticed by her. We're here. They stood before a deep cavern, surrounded by a waterfall that thundered down to the whooshing vortex at the bottom. Frogs were croaking nearby, wagtails dipping on rocks and dragons soaring above the mountains. It never ceased to amaze Visenya how beautiful this place was. Did you bring me here so you can see me swimming in the nude? She jibed, an impish grin tugged at her pink lips. Naruto rolled his eyes and pointed a finger at the cave mouth. To be a dragon warden, first you must be acknowledged. Be acknowledged? Visenya repeated, her voice perplexed. You will understand once you go in. The raw and palpable magic lurking within the chilling darkness roused her excitement and frightened her at the same time. With a determined look on her face, she bucked up and followed her master into the cave. The sound of dripping water and their echoing footsteps were not the only things she heard. There was the snore of something, big that lay ahead. Dread was coiling in her stomach. Hugging herself, she managed a weak mutter. What, is that? I give you, Ghidorah, the mother of dragons. A soul-piercing red eye opened, and like flames in the pit of darkness, it lit up the cavern. Slit eyes suddenly focused on Visenya and the intensity almost made her backpedal. Swallowing the awe down her throat, she squared her shoulders, stood upright, and bit her lower lip. There was no room for weaknesses, not before this behemoth. All dragons could trace their lineage back to her. She is their undisputed queen. A goddess that even the dragons worship. What must I do? You have sworn your sword to me, now, you swear your soul to her. Promise her that you will protect her children with your entire being. Promise her you will protect the dragon's keep with your life. Naruto gave a short pause. Break your oath, however, and she will bring you your end. Visenya dropped to one knee, as if awaiting to be knighted by the great dragon. I, Visenya Targaryen, swear on my honor and my life that I will protect your children and their children before them, from this day until my last day. Ghidorah shut its eyes, her slumber took over her. She has acknowledged you. The dragons will come to know you. Visenya stood up. Does that mean I am respected by the dragons? You are being acknowledged, yes. Respect, however, is a different thing. Let us leave Ghidorah to her sleep. We have much to discuss. X. O. X. O. X. The first night in Dragon's Keep was surprisingly peaceful for Visenya. Vogger slept soundly by her side, its serpentine frame curled around its master protectively. Visenya sat on a log, watching the crackling bonfire with intrigue. Earlier, she was instructed to collect weed and firewood. What happened afterwards had startled her. Naruto spew out a plume of white flames, igniting the bonfire that kept them warm. 
Words couldn't describe Visenya's astonishment. What magic could grant its wielder the ability to have a dragon's tongue? Fascinating. Her journey to Dragon's Keep hadn't been a waste of time after all. There were so much mystery for her to unfold and so much adventure to get into. Call her crazy, but she was sure she had only seen the tip of the iceberg. H how did you do that? Naruto swore he saw stars sparkling in Visenya's violet eyes. In time, you will be able to bend the elements. Like a spoiled child, Visenya didn't have the patience to wait. She yearned for the feeling of being a dragon, just like Vogger. We can start now, I'm willing to learn. Patience. Naruto chided, silencing any further protest. Your training commences tomorrow. Visenya nodded, satisfied with the answer. She couldn't wait to do half the things Naruto could do. By the way, when I went into the smoking sea, I felt magic in the fog. Is that you're doing? I. Naruto glanced up. I created a dome of magic that enwraps dragon's keep. Visenya raised a brow. To keep things out, to keep things in. He corrected. It will be a disaster if the dragons were to roam amongst mankind. Humans are not ready to protect themselves from dragons. They are as intelligent as they are dangerous. If history has taught me anything, it is that mankind cannot be trusted. But we can? It wasn't an argument. Visenya sincerely wanted to know the truth. That's why we swear an oath. To protect dragons keep. There is no honor in doing this. You don't get credit for nurturing dragons. Bards will not sing song for our hard work. Nobody will recognize our gallantry and sacrifice. We do this so that mankind gets to have a future. Naruto sighed. I have lived a long time. I know what humans are capable of if they wield great power. Absolute power corrupts. Frustration boiled within Visenya. There were so much things she could do if she were to be a sovereign. I strongly disagree. Look at Westeros and Essos. Do you know what I saw? War? Poverty, corruption, hunger, misery, and so much suffering. Dragons can become a deterrent to all that. Staying here and taking care of the dragons is not going to solve any problem. You have all the power to change all that, to make people's lives better. The fire in Visenya's eyes were unquenched by Naruto's glare. Do not vilify me. You cannot even begin to fathom what it's like. I did not sit on their shoulders and urge them to procreate when they don't even have any means to feed themselves. I did not ask them to kill or rape or steal. I have never made them do anything. Mankind did all the depravity themselves because they are capricious, and this doesn't change anything. With all your great powers, you choose to do nothing. You don't even care if there is suffering, so long as you are shut off from this world. That is evil itself. We are caretakers of this keep. Our responsibility is far greater. The affairs of the outside world is none of our concern. Naruto dismissed frostily. I am not uttering polite suggestion, girl. My word is law. Fuming with rage, Visenya looked away. Naruto dumped a handful of twigs into the bonfire, his voice softened. If you have lived as long as I did, you will understand. No matter what you do to try and change the world for the better, it will always return to where it was. So long as the seeds of evil fester within the hearts of men, this world will continue to rot. All we can do is to preserve the peace. Keep the dragons away from humans. My brother and sister have dragons. Visenya argued. Are you going to take them away too? No, he replied without any hesitation, surprising her. They're bonded with their masters. That's the beauty of dragons. They're loyal to a fault. As long as your brother is a just ruler and shows restraint when exercising his power, I will not take it away. Pray that he and his descendants don't screw up. Visenya's brows furrowed. Their dragons can breed though. Naruto scoffed. It seems like you were clueless about dragons mating rituals. Trust me, dragons are very particular with mates. And they don't do it as often as rabbit does. You will understand soon enough. After all, your dragon is female. This got her curiosity piqued. Vogger is female? I'm not surprised if you don't know. Dragon does not exhibit identifiable UAL dimorphism, so it is natural for mortals to think they are all. I can assure you that they are not, and many of my dragons will be coming for her soon. Naruto gutted a few fishes that he had caught and fried them over their bonfire. Alduin is the strongest in his flock, so he'll be the first to court Vogger. Visenya giggled and stroked Vogger's scale. I was there when she hatched from her eggs. She was so cute when she yipped at me. And now, she is all grown up. 
She has fought wars with me. She was there for me when I cried. She was there when I won the war. I can't imagine a life without her. You will have more children soon. Visenya blinked and turned to Naruto. A twinkle of mischief shone in her violet eyes and she grinned. Her tone warped into a much sultry one. Oh, you will give me more children? Oblivious of the innuendo that he had uttered, he nodded. Yes. As Dragon Warden, it is our duty to love and care for all the dragons equally. They're our children. Pouting to herself, Visenya decided to do some investigation of her own. So, have you lay with any women before? Naruto looked up, his expression still impassive. I have only bedded the woman I loved. Oh, who's she? It doesn't matter now, she's dead. Naruto handed the stick of fish that he had cooked to Visenya. Staring at the perfectly grilled fish, Visenya's voice lowered but hopeful. Do you think your stone heart has any room for other woman? My wife loved me unconditionally. She believed in me when nobody did. She loved me even when I have nothing. There is no woman like her. Naruto heaved out a sigh and stood up. Eat well and catch a good rest. You have a long day ahead of you tomorrow. With that, Naruto's frame dissolved into a whirlwind of leaves. He really needs to teach me that too. X, O, X, O, X. Morning came too early for Visenya's taste. Everything that had happened, this odyssey she had inadvertently embarked on, were like a dream to her. In this wonderland where dragons thrived, she was a willing prisoner. Disrobing, she tested the temperature of the water with her feet, to think that a hot spring existed. When she soaked herself in the pool, the scars on her white, peerless skin was healing, like magic. I see that you have found the hot spring. Visenya let out an indignant shriek and covered her modesty with her hands. W what are you? She was in such dismay that she failed to realize Naruto was standing atop the water surface. You said you wanted to learn what I know, right? Warily, she nodded. Good. Stay naked. W what? Visenya stared incredulously at Naruto. What had become of him? Did his carnal desire for her erased all traces of his morality? Panic overwhelmed her when Naruto stripped himself in a blink of an eye and allowed himself to sink into the water. She would have slapped him with all her righteous fury if it wasn't for his apathetic features. What are you doing? Dignified and prideful she might be, but Visenya was still a maiden. She sure as hell wasn't ready to be taken like this, I said. He cupped his hand over her mouth to silence her. Have you had breakfast yet? Visenya shook her head weakly. I am going to break your limits. Try not to bite down your tongue. This will hurt, a lot? Naruto hoisted his hand in the air. Azure fire lit up on his fingertips and without warning he slammed his hand on Visenya's bare chest. Searing agony shot up her entire being, causing her body to convulse furiously. She let out a silent scream and keeled over as tears were rolling down her bloodshot eyes. Fight the pain. Don't let it get to you. His voice, though soothing, wasn't making her plight any better. Her nails dug into his back as she clung onto him like life support. The gnawing pain in her skull became scalding. She shut her eyes in a grimace. What in the seven hell was this? Her muscle was boiling, her bones aching, and every fiber of her being was commanding her to end her torment with a swift suicide. It's done. Just like that, the horrendous pain vanished. Panting laboriously, Visenya felt faint. She would have collapsed if Naruto didn't wrap his arms around her lithe body. Close your eyes and search within you, do you feel it? The ringing in her ear was nauseating, but she could still hear what he said. In the midst of her affliction, she did take notice of how sculpted his body was. The old wounds and scars riddled his body only made him all the more, attractive. And then she soaked in his scent. It was euphoric. Pine and, roses. He smelled wonderful. By the gods. What was she thinking? It was then she felt something empowering inside her. A surge of boundless energy skyrocketed from within, flooding her body with adrenaline. The dam that was holding her back had erupted. This sensation made her feel invincible. It was as if she could take on the world. That's right. Visenya Targaryen was reborn. Visenya. Visenya glanced up, her eyes inebriated. What was this heat throbbing in her stomach? She didn't understand it and it was driving her insane. Hot. Why was her body burning with lust? Untamable lust. That was all she could muster when she looked deep into Naruto's worried blue eyes. A giggle escaped her as she licked her lips. 
Intoxicated by desire and enslaved by passion, Visenya crashed her lips onto Naruto's. A year had flown by and Visenya Targaryen still get flustered whenever the thought of kissing Naruto crossed her mind. It was surreal, and she almost had him all to herself, but his unwavering willpower had compelled him not to take advantage of an intoxicated woman, not that she would mind. The rejection didn't discourage Visenya. On the contrary, she was dazzled by his impeccable self-restraint and integrity. Visenya's beauty was the inspiration of a painter's dream. She might not be adept in the arts of seduction, unlike her promiscuous sister, but she knew no men should be able to resist her. That spoke volume about Naruto's virtue and she admired him for that. Visenya was diligent when it came to her training. Whatever hell Naruto threw at her, she never once complained, but strived to outdo herself. Unfortunately, she had no affinity with fire and couldn't possess a dragon's tongue. With sheer determination, Visenya was able to realize her true strength. Ice and snow did her bidding. She had grown stronger in Dragon's Keep than she ever could have imagined, but that didn't extinguish the fire in her belly. Ambitious for power and hungry for knowledge, Visenya would challenge Naruto to a duel every week. To test her limits, although she had never bested her master, she never gave up and it was her enthusiasm that captivated him. If I win, you will bring me to Bravos. Naruto raised a brow. This is your, how many times have I defeated you? Visenya puffed out her cheeks, peeving at her master's lofty manners. Are you going to bring me there or not? Scratching the back of his scalp, he yawned. Why bravos? She shrugged. I heard many great things about that place. Never been there, actually. Besides, it's always nice to breathe in air from the outside world every once in a while. All right then. I shall humor you. If you manage to get me down on my knees, I will bring you to bravos. A glint of mischief flashed across his sapphire eyes. But if you lose, you will be cleaning Alduin's cave for a month. At that, Visenya whined vociferously. No fair, nothing in life is fair, my dear. The question is, are you ready to clean Alduin's cave for a month? Unsheathing dark sister, Visenya's eyelid twitched and squared her shoulders. Your arrogance will be your downfall, master. Oh, are you not going to? Reacting to impulse, Naruto sidestepped a sword thrust aimed at his right eye. Whoa, I didn't even shout start. Unleashing a barrage of slashes with her sword, Visenya grinned. Nothing in life is fair, master. Without hesitation, she fired a swift uppercut at her master's jaw. As anticipated, the assault failed to connect to her target, but that was part of her plan. She leapt into the air and delivered a butterfly kick that sent him skidding a good meter away, right where she wanted him to be. Plunging her sword into the soil, she slammed her hands into a prayer motion. Geysers of ice shot out from the earth, freezing their battlefield into a barren tundra. Naruto was befuddled. Visenya had come a long way to mastering her magic. Nevertheless, it would take more than just sharp icicles to take him down. Do not rejoice yet. Ominous black clouds sprawled across the sky, morphing and swirling furiously into a vortex. The thunder rumbled across the valley and a jagged flashes of pure light enveloped Dragon's Keep. No matter how many times Visenya bore witness to this phenomenon, she couldn't help but gape in awe and trepidation. The tornado that came down afterwards plucked out trees like they were nothing. Yield, my dear, Visenya growled. Never, you're lost. A gale hit her with so much force that she almost flew off, but she was prepared for it. Ice had rooted her feet to the ground ensuring her safety, for now. You can't win. As much as she hated to admit it, there was no way she could freeze a freaking tornado, but that didn't mean all hope was lost. She still have a trump card under her sleeve. Whatever she was about to do was a one-hit thing. If it failed, she would be drained of her entire strength. That's why failure wasn't an option. Visenya raised both of her slender hands and let out her fiercest war cry. At first, Naruto was intrigued but the smugness on his face was wiped off when a blast of snow struck him. Wait, did she just bring down a blizzard with her? Impossible. Just how far did she blossom? The snow might have engulfed her, but it did not veil the gold of her laughter or how elegant her joy was. Distracted, Naruto didn't see a spear of ice coming his way. It was pure instinct that prevented him from being decapitated, but in his carelessness, he tripped on a sheet of slippery ice and sank into one knee. Ha! Huh. This position suits you, master. The howling and ferocious wind dissipated into soothing breeze. 
Heaven's rays seeped through the cracks of the dark clouds, melting the snow that devoured the grassland. Basenya was so ecstatic about her victory that she didn't realize she had depleted all of her strength. Her eyes rolled back and everything went numb. When Basenya had come to, she was in Naruto's warm embrace. Butterflies fluttered in her stomach as she took in his alluring scent. He had always held her tight like this whenever she exhausted herself, as if fearing that she would leave him. And she would melt in his strong arms like a love-struck fool. Perhaps it was Naruto's gnawing past that stopped him from pursuing any intimate relationship with Visenya. Impatient as she was, she could never bring herself to force herself on him. Whenever she saw his grief-stricken eyes and the insurmountable pain on his grimaced features, her heart pang. Master, I. Naruto smiled. You've won. Finally, Visenya chuckled weakly, I gave it my all. That you did. He helped her to her feet and offered her his brightest beam. Catch some rest. We'll set off to Bravo's tomorrow. X. O. X. O. X soaring in the imperial sky with Vagar had always been a thrill to Visenya. She could never get tired of this rush. After immersing herself in arcane magic and cleaning up dragon's dung, a vacation wouldn't hurt. That didn't mean she was sloppy with her duties. No she took pride being a dragon warden, but she had the heart of a true dragon. And a dragon loved freedom above all else. To feel the wind blowing her hair back. To feel the warmth of the sun brushing across her skin. To touch the clouds beneath her feet. This moment was perfect and she prayed it would stay. Alduin's roar could be heard from the distant. The dragon of destruction. The world breaker. What a fierce beast. She had no idea how Naruto managed to tame that condescending, overgrown lizard. Despite being a dragon warden herself, she couldn't gain Alduin's respect, no matter how hard she tried. The egotistical dragon bent his neck to no one but Naruto. It even had the audacity to sneer at her when she cleaned his cave. Hey, Naruto, who was riding Alduin, waved at her, I'll race you. Loser tends to the cattle's field for a month. Arg. It was no secret between them that they despised cattle duty. It was mundane, an unavoidable chore, and pretty much a bane to their existence, but it had to be done. Orok, sheep, elk and bison were precious livestock. Still, Visenya was always up for a challenge. Challenge accepted. Visenya patted Vogger's nape and bellowed, win this race for mommy. Vogger let out an invigorated roar before she sped towards their destination. In the past year, Visenya had managed to pull the great and mighty dragon warden down from his high horses. He had opened up to her, which made her realize how much of a giant bag of douche he secretly was. Dealing with her master's erratic mood swings was not her forte, but she survived well. It also allowed her to experience things she had never felt before. Weaknesses. Humility. Power. But most of all, love. Her moment of peace was shattered when she saw Alduin bolted past Vogger, her master's almost childlike woohoo filled the air. She rolled her eyes. What a show off. Don't let Alduin beat you. Show him what you're made of, Vogger. For what was a few hours had been an eternity for Visenya. The dragons crossed the continent and finally reached their destination together. Alduin and Vogger dove down from the clouds, overseeing the wonder that was Bravos. The Titan of Bravos, the colossal monolith that served as Bravos's trademark, befuddled Visenya. Frankly, she couldn't fathom how its people had built it, but it was an amazing sight, for it was the epitome of Bravos's values acceptance, diversity, tolerance, and harmony. The rest of the world should really learn a thing or two from Bravos, Visenya reckoned. When they disembarked from their dragons on a high platform, Visenya was ecstatic beyond cognizant. Finally, civilization, everything is awesome. Naruto chuckled and watched as their dragons took off to the sky. Do not attract any attention to yourself. Don't start fights. Don't stand out. Just blend in and stay cool at all times. Got it. She gave Naruto a thumb up and threw the hood of her cloak over her head. The trip to the cobblestoned Moonsinger Lane was bursting with noises and color for Visenya. The assortment of bars and shops were bustling with people, truly a splendor to behold. And then something odd struck Visenya. It seemed like Naruto knew where he was going. There was a sense of focus from him as he navigated his way through the busy crowd. Perplexed, she didn't see where she was going and accidentally bumped into someone. How dare you? Do you know who stands before you? Oops. 
The pompous and plump man that Basenya had the misfortune of bumping into had a stench of arrogance. A long stick was pretty much inserted in his ass, if the way he looked down upon Naruto and Visenya was anything to go by. It took every fiber of her being not to lash out and gouge his eyes out. Seriously, how could Naruto not be ticked off? If this blowhard thought Visenya was going to submit, then he had another think coming. Without acknowledging the prick in a royal getup, Naruto strode past him. The guardsmen raised their spears at him. Big mistake. Kneel before the son of the Sea Lord, Lord Yosef Loridan, the guardsmen yelled. The self entitled man with a beer belly snickered. The blonde continued walking. He barely even spared them a glance. H. Hey! Stop! Leave us alone! Naruto's voice was frosty. They were annoyingly persistent. One of them decided to block Naruto's path with hoisted spears. I said stop. No, w what? Rolling his eyes, Naruto calmed his nerves. This day wasn't going according to plan. I said no. But we have spears. The guardsmen reasoned. This man was either perturbingly insouciant about his predicament or simply had a death wish. Everybody in Bravos knew about the son of the Sea Lord. There was yet anybody who dared stand up against them and live to tell the tale. This was a first. I don't care. Naruto didn't really have any to give, if anything, he was more annoyed than he was afraid, waiting for the guard to clear the way. When he realized that they weren't going to budge, his fingers twitched. If you don't kneel, we'll kill you, oh boy, Visenya licked her lips anxiously, blood before lunch, what a treat. Naruto furrowed his brows. Why? Because you disrespected Lord Yosef. So, the peasants had scampered out of sight, they knew a fight was about to break out and it was not a smart thing to be near in such commotion. It didn't take a genius to figure out that Yosef had been riding on the coattail of his father's status as sea lord and bullied the small folk for years. Visenya placed a hand on the hilt of her sword, her mind already strategizing the most efficient way to eviscerate her foes. You don't look like you're from Bravos, the captain of the guardsmen sneered. Where are you from? Naruto shrugged. I don't know, you do know, stop playing dumb. Attack me. What? Did I stutter? The guardsmen were unsure what to do. They expected submission, not placid resistance. Unlike the cowering peasants, Naruto did not care if Yosef was the sea lord or a god for that matter. Frustrated, Yosef barked. Just kill him already. Visenya. Madness and glee flashed across Visenya's violet eyes as she unsheathed her sword, with pleasure. In a blink of an eye, Visenya morphed into a burst of wind. A shockwave exploded, sending spider web fissures all over the brick walls around them. Those jolly assholes didn't know how their throats were sliced open. Yosef stared agape at how bizarre things turned out. One moment, his men were about to impale the aggravating blonde, and then said blonde called out a name, and next thing he knew, all of his men crumbled like a sack of potatoes, their blood pooling underneath their mutilated corpses. Crippling fear overwhelmed the son of the Sea Lord, if his soiled pants were any indication. S. Stay back. Do you know who I am? My father can have you. As if on cue, a man emerged from the side of the alley and sank a sucker punch right into Yosef's face. Said man spun around, dropped to his knees, and bellowed with vigor. Lord Warden, we do not know you are here on a visit. Please forgive Lord Yosef for his impudence. Naruto raised a brow. Do I know you? No, you don't know me, but I know you. I am Wilhelm Antarian, the first sword of Bravos. The man was built like a brick shithouse, armed to the teeth, but smart like a whip, fitting to be the first sword of Bravos. And pray tell, how do you recognize me? Your cloak. Wilhelm glanced up and steeled his gaze, a facade to hide his dread. Nobody in Bravos would dare wear the sigil of the Dragon Warden. The swirl of the maelstrom. All Bravo that serve the Sea Lord are taught about the legends of the Great Dragon Warden. Our ancestors owe you a huge debt. The whole of Bravos owe you a huge debt. It is truly an honor to meet you. Naruto switched his cold glance to the confused Yosef, who was sitting on a puddle of his own making. It seems that the prosperity of Bravos has led its leaders to be arrogant. Why are you not killing him? Yosef screamed at Wilhelm, spit and senseless rage spew out of his mouth. You worthless nobody, your family serves my father. If you don't collect his inghead, I will have your family hanged. Do you understand me? Kill this vermin now? Silence. 
Bilheim shot a heated glare at Yosef and growled, We will talk about this later. Something was amiss, Visenya thought. Why would Bilheim venerate Naruto? As a matter of fact, the denizen of this city were in a state of terror when they laid eyes on him. It would seem that Naruto had some unseemly ties with Bravos. There was more than meets the eye about this, she was sure of it. Naruto sighed. Do not give me a reason to pay the Sea Lord a visit, do I make myself clear? Crystal, Lord Warden. Scurry away then. With haste, Wilhelm tossed Yosef over his shoulder, who was trashing about and screaming bloody murder, and jogged out of the alley. Visenya cocked a brow and turned to her master. What was that? And why does that first sword of Bravos fear you so much? He looks like he just saw a ghost or something. At that, Naruto offered Visenya an innocent smile. I do not know what you're talking about. Let us go find the seamstress. You are in dire need of some new clothes. But first, let's go get us some ramen. Ramen? What's that? The food from the gods. Now let us hurry. X. O. X. O. X opulent was the word to describe the Sea Lord's palace. Black marble and gold pillars sparkled with wealth and glamour. The architecture of the abode bespoke, a symbol of Bravos's vast fortune. The Sea Lord of Bravos, Vigo Loridan, ensconced in his throne, unhappy about the news. Word had it that his first sword had assaulted his son, an act of treason of the highest caliber. However, Wilhelm was strong as he was wise, a man of virtue who wouldn't even entertain the thoughts of betting a whore. Absurd as it might be, every lie contained some trinket of truth. For prudence's sake, Vigo contained his fury. I heard you struck my son, may I ask why? The first sword of Bravos knelt before his sea lord. Your son tried to have the dragon warden killed. The chamber fell into a dead silence. For a moment, only the deafening void accompanied them. When the sea lord came out of his stupor, his hand shakily reached out to a goblet of wine. The dragon warden? Impossible. It had been a century since the dragon warden laid waste to Bravos. How was he even alive? Tread lightly, the sea lord before him had incessantly warned. There might be a plethora of religions in Bravos, but the Aborigines worshipped only one god, the Dragon Warden. Our scout spotted dragons flying around Bravos, it is really him. Did, the Dragon Warden killed my son? No he didn't. Vigo leaned into his throne, jaw unhinged and horror marred on his aged face. I, need more than just a drink. W where is my son? Where is he? Go get him, now. Right away, sir. Wilhelm stood up and went to retrieve Yosef. It was at this very moment, Vigo knew his son had ed up big time. He needed a drink. No one drink wouldn't do. Even a gallon of it wouldn't help ease his migraine. Gesturing his squire to fetch him a barrel of wine, Vigo let out a furious growl. The sea lord before him were taught to fear the dragon warden for a reason. Hell, even the iron bank fear the dragon warden and the Iron Bank was infamous for grabbing kings by their balls. When the wine was brought to him, so did his son. Yosef babbled on about some gibberish mess, but Vigo didn't pay attention. Frankly, Vigo didn't hear half the rubbish his son had spat. For what seemed like eons, Yosef kept on going, denouncing the petulant man who didn't pay tribute to him and degrading Wilhelm for tarnishing his dignity. So, with great resolve, the sea lord stood up from his throne and ambled silently towards his son. Though he was inebriated, his mind was clear. Father? The sea lord chugged down his wine and tossed the goblet aside. Nice coat. Yosef blinked. T thanks, I got it. Vigo buried his fist unforgivingly into his son's stomach. Yosef tumbled flat on his back, groaning in agony. Wilhelm sighed and watched with stifled satisfaction as the self absorbed, Blue blooded snot vomited his guts out. This wasn't going to turn out pretty. As a sea lord, Vigo was ruthless in his dealings and had rarely made compromises. It was his iron fist that made Bravos prospered and feared. Do you know what you did that anger me so, my son? I, I didn't do anything. That man tried to kill me, I was trying to defend myself, father, you have to execute him. That was the last straw. Vigo could only tolerate ignorance for so long. He lifted his son up by his collars and stared right into his eyes. Do you know who that man is? That man that you tried to kill? That worthless nobody? Heaving out a sigh, Vigo pushed his son aside and reached out for another goblet of wine. 
His hands were shaking as he devoured his beverage. That worthless nobody, is the dragon warden. In frantic rage, Vigo pointed out of his window. Do you see the titan of bravos out there? That statue was built by our ancestors to honor him, you ingrate. What's so great about him? W what's so great about him? The sea lord glowered at his son and objurgated. If you have attended your classes, you would know what that man did to bravos. Now I have to give you a goddamn history lesson about bravos. Fetch me more wine. The poor squire flinched horribly and almost tripped in his footing when he delivered wine to the infuriated sea lord. A good hundred years ago, bravos was run by slavers. Just like the other free cities, inequity breeds crimes. Crimes breeds hatred. Hatred brings suffering. Bravos was the capital of slavery. Our ancestors were slaves themselves too. And then came one fine afternoon. The slavers shot down one of the warden's dragon. Captured it. Tortured it. Those fools sealed their fates. Vigo sat back down on his throne, his gaze glazed. The warden found out about it. Came down on Bravos with great vengeance. Slavers. Army. Their gods didn't save them from the warden's fury. He burned them all down. Every last one of them. And he didn't bring a dragon with him to get the job done. No, he brought hundreds of them with him. And even a three headed leviathan. Bravos has no slavers because the warden revolutionizes it with blood and ashes. One man did the impossible. Overnight, the slave capital became a city of free men. Nursing his throbbing headache, Vigo shut his eyes. When the other cities heard about what happened, they didn't believe it, so they came after Bravos with the intent to conquer. Pentos. Volantis. Mir. They marched by the thousands. And they died by the thousands too. The bodies that he had slaughtered, hanged and incinerated that day, laid the foundation of what we are now. Since then, Bravasi praised him as the titan and we thrived on for a hundred years. As reality crept in, fury filmed Vigo's eyes, and then, my son, you went and threatened him with death. Do you have any idea what that ing means? Father, I can make things right, the sea lord scowled. How? By killing the dragon warden. Did you even hear what the I just said? It is done, father, Yosef pleaded. I have already hired the faceless men to get the job done. Vigo almost choked on his spit. Why you did what? X. O. X. O. X delight filled Visenya's senses as she slurped down her fifth bowl of ramen. Sauteed toppings, soft flavored chicken broth that gave her palate a bomb of tangy flavors, and silky noodles made it truly an extraordinary experience. Naruto couldn't help but chuckled as Visenya was humming a cheery tune while she drank her soup. I see that you have tasted heaven. What is this ramen? Why have I not heard of it before? Naruto grinned. It is a gift bestowed to Bravos. It's part of the Bravasi cuisine, actually. You will not find it in Westeros. Visenya flashed a toothy grin at Naruto and took a sip at her, coffee? The fragrance of milk and the bitterness of the coffee beans blended together in perfect harmony. Truly a pleasure to the senses. A milk mustache donned Visenya's pink lips, making Naruto go tut tut in disapproval. He pulled out his handkerchief and wiped the stain off her full lips. Stunned, Visenya stared wide eyes at her master. Heart racing, she averted her gaze. Um. I'm glad that you like this place. If Naruto took notice of Visenya's flustered cheeks, he didn't show it. Instead, he directed a smile at the waitress, whom was collecting their plates. Visenya caught a glimpse of the bitch staring shamelessly at her master. How dare her! Mesmerized, the tramp skipped jauntily back to the kitchen, much to Visenya's stifled rage. I'm going to kill her, Naruto blinked. What? Visenya's dark demeanor stretched into a bright smile. What? Anyway. There is an inn nearby. We can reserve ourselves two bedrooms for the night. One bedroom will do. Visenya chuckled sheepishly. I mean, we shouldn't spend so irresponsibly when we can save more for adventures. Besides, you did promise me that you'll get me more clothes, no? Naruto laughed heartily. I almost forgot. Let's get you some chainmail and leather boots later. When Naruto smiled, tiny details like the crinkle from the corner of his eyes wouldn't go unnoticed by her. Just like a ray of sunshine, his smile shone a light of hope on her, whisking away her fears and making her feel happy to be alive. Why did she always feel so vulnerable before him? Visenya was no expert of such things, but she always become a bundle of nerves whenever she had a moment with her master. 
cradling the cup of coffee in her hands, she glanced up. Do you think I would look beautiful in a dress? That caught Naruto off guard. He could never visualize Visenya in a dress. You look perfect as it is. What seemed to be a casual compliment from Naruto actually meant a lot to Visenya. Do you think I should get a dress? If it makes you happy. Naruto tilted his head, musing to himself. But is it practical though? I mean, we're glorified shepherds. Most of our time are spent on grasslands, not fancy bars and restaurants. It makes me happy. Visenya glared. I want it. Yup. No argument to that. Naruto did a sturgeon face and nodded. We're getting you a dress then. Happiness gave her giggle an enthralling melody, much like an auditory hug. Without knowing how it happened, Naruto realized that he had relished in teasing her because he wanted to get a little closer to her. When they shared stories under the starry night and laughed about God's knew what, he took everything she said to heart. How pathetic of him to think that he had fantasied about her protege. This was just a phase, he reassured himself incessantly. Her ferocity in battle bested only by her beauty, and her beauty was matched by her devotion to the dragon's keep. In her, he saw greatness, a woman who had the blood of a conqueror running through her veins. Their responsibility to the dragon's keep far outweigh anything. As much as he loathed to admit, he didn't deserve her. Shaking his head, he pushed down those thoughts, dropped a gold dragon on the table and ushered his apprentice out of the restaurant. As they took to the streets, Naruto was surprised when Visenya coiled her arm around his elbow. Just before he could protest, she shut him down. It will be weird if the two of us loiter along this avenue like a couple of assassins. That'll attract attention. We want to blend in, remember? Naruto laughed. He hadn't laughed so lively for a long time. Truthfully, he could make do with these new changes. Can't argue with that. You know, I never really get to ask you something. He cocked a brow. Ask away. Do you aspire to be something more than just being a dragon warden? I always wanted to build a new world where I could live with my family, in peace. No worries, you know. Open country. Room to grow. Things don't need to be complicated. A bittersweet smile curled up his lips as he thought about a future that would never be. I never expect myself to outlive them. How do you live with it? The loneliness. Taking care of dragons has its perks. It keeps you distracted enough to forget about the noises. Naruto chuckled. Besides, you can't get so hung up on the past that you forget to make the most of what you are now. As they sauntered through the bazaar, Visenya caught a glimpse of a bronze mirror from a nearby stall that reflected something suspicious behind them. Amidst the crowd, she spotted someone tailing after them. Naruto? Did you only just pick up on that? A carefree, almost dauntless grin played about Naruto's lips. That woman has been following us for quite some time now. Visenya giggled. Care to make a bet with me? Naruto raised a brow. A gambling addict now, are we? I bet the Sea Lord sent his regards to you. Tapping a finger on his chin, Naruto pondered for a few seconds. What's the bet? Ghidorah's cave. Two weeks of cleaning. Naruto rolled his eyes. I bet the Sea Lord's son sent his regards to us. Deal. Visenya smirked. Are we not going to engage this assailant? Nah. Too troublesome. Besides, she is not going to attack us now, not when we are surrounded with people. Too many things could go wrong. An assassin only goes in for the kill when the opportunity presents itself. If she is where I think she is from, then she will not take action, at least not yet. Sounds like fun. Slyly, Visenya leaned closer to Naruto, her pressed lightly against his biceps. Now tell me. Why do the people in Bravos fear you? Everywhere we go, people seem to give us strange looks. Is there some secrets you're hiding? Something hideous and dark that I'm not aware of? Oblivious to Visenya's subtle but lascivious gesture, Naruto looked thoughtful. Do you want to hear the long story or a short one? Oh, are you a storyteller now? I can summarize it in just a few words. Can you do that? Naruto chuckled softly. Do you want it crude or sweet? Crude. Visenya giggled. They ed up, so I ed them up. And what's the whole story behind your grandiose accolade? Naruto shrugged. When old Valyria fell, anarchy consumed Essos. The slavers held power, so most of the lands were dominated by them. Long story short, one of my dragons, Smaug, fled Dragon's Keep. It is not uncommon of them to do so. After all, 
They are creatures who adore freedom. Unfortunately, Smaug was only a hatchling when he flew across Bravos. He was too young. Too naive and curious for his own good. His hide wasn't strong enough to withstand primitive weapons like, arrows. Lucky shot, but it did the trick. They shot him down from the sky and captured him. Well, this was an eye-opener for Visenya. Contrary to misconceptions, dragons weren't vicious monstrosity. They were loyal and curious, but their intimidating looks sure gave them a bad reputation. Smaug, however, had an unhealthy hatred for anything that wasn't gold. Not even other dragons dared trespass Smaug's lair, lest they earned his ire. The only reason she could even get remotely near the ill-tempered dragon without becoming snack was because Naruto was giving him a sponge bath. Smaug loved his sponge bath. None has greater affinity to magic than dragons themselves. Those who wield magic have a connection to the force of life. It is said that if the dragons die, magic die with them too. I believe you can feel Vogger's emotions, no? Now that Visenya thought about it, she could always tell if Vogger was in distress or in joy. It has always been second nature to me. I never thought much about it, really. Naruto sighed. I don't just feel dragons' emotions. If they are experiencing affliction, I can experience their pain too. So, you felt Smaug's pain when he was being tortured? They set molten lava on his scales just to test his durability. They tore his talons to build swords. They broke his bones to feel powerful. The only time he gets to rest is when they bury him in gold. There is a reason why Smaug loves to collect gold. It keeps him safe. It takes away his pain. Pinching the bridge of his nose, Naruto shook his head. I failed him as a father. I couldn't protect him. That is my greatest regret. There was no doubt that Naruto loved his dragons. If mishap befell Vagar, Visenya would wage war if she had to. I get it. You killed many humans. Do you ever feel remorse? Do you feel remorse when you step on an ant? Visenya arched a brow. Do you really see humans as ants? If you have lived the life that I did, everything is insignificant to you. Visenya's eyelid twitched. Am I an ant to you? Nope, you're special. That made Visenya's beautiful face lit up. Really? I want to be delicate here. How do I put it? You're more like a butterfly. What? She furiously hammered her master's shoulder with her fist and let out a shriek. A butterfly. I'm just joking. Naruto nursed his shoulder and stifled a chuckle. Learn to take a joke, will ya? Unbelievable. Visenya fumed. This is too much. Unexpectedly, Naruto flicked a few lock of lustrous golden locks over Visenya's head playfully. All right, jokes aside, let's address the assassin. Visenya tidied her disheveled hair and shot Naruto an irritated pout. I thought you wouldn't ask. Their stroll led them under a sequestered bridge, exactly where they wanted themselves to be. When they spun around, acting on pure instinct, Naruto caught an arrow directed right at Visenya's eye. Someone is being impatient. While Visenya's beauty was regal and ethereal, this woman was the embodiment of sins. The glimmer in her amethyst purple eyes could shame the stars. The cherry pink tint on her cheeks was begging for kisses. Her bob shaped bouffant hair was chic. The loose fitting gown embellished her beauteous figure and barely held her ample bosom, and her long slender legs pale as porcelain. She was perfection made real, much like those Targaryen princesses. An oil paper parasol rested on her creamy shoulder, her fingers tracing about the cane. You have to die, my lord. The many faced god demands it. You are no ordinary courtesan. Naruto tilted his head, finding the woman rather familiar. Where had he seen her before? Manners maketh man. My lady, what is your name? She narrowed her eyes, wary of her target's intention, Samui. The realization hit him like getting tackled by a dragon. It all made so much sense now. Her stoic demeanor, that unnatural beauty, the resemblance was uncanny. Could it be possible that Samui had reincarnated? Wait. Was reincarnation even a thing to being with? Could this mean that his comrades were amongst the living? A thousand questions bombarded Naruto. If reincarnation existed, then did that mean he could see her? And no, he shook his head furiously. Let it go. Forget about her, nothing could change that, nothing. Hanada is dead. Let the past die. The conflict and turmoil on his face were soon morphed into anger. Your accent has already blown away your cover. You are not from Essos. 
The embroidery of your dress is from Volantis. What is your real name? You do not need to know anything, your death will soon be upon you. Absolutely disgusting. Basenya was exasperated by the staring contest that Naruto and Samui shared. If anything, she was the one who deserved all of her master's attention, not that skank. If only Naruto could just give her the frigging order, she would shove her sword up where the sun didn't shine and make that bimbo squirm for mercy. Then again, Samui never stood a chance to begin with. Her master was impervious to injuries, Basenya would know because she had once beheaded him and the bastard just picked up his head and planted it right back on his bloody neck. Needless to say, Basenya fainted that day. Meanwhile, Naruto had regained his composure and a black sword slid out from his sleeves. Almost immediately, Samui was on guard. Screams of pain and distorted cries of anguish could be heard as Naruto gave his black sword a few practice swings. Every swing he made, Samui heard a thousand damned souls calling out for her, weeping and demanding to be freed. Demonic. Utterly evil. If Samui was any lesser, she would have scrambled away. Only a sword that had slain thousands could emanate such a vile aura. No wonder the son of the Sea Lord paid such a handsome price for her target's head. Very well. The many-faced god has been trying to claim me for quite some time now. I hope you have what it takes. Much to Visenya and Naruto's surprise, Samui's blade radiated a bright effulgence. Electricity whiplashed into existence, encircling around Samui. I know a man who coats lightning on his sword, I considered him my brother. Samui narrowed her eyes. Where is he? Dead. Naruto didn't smile or bat an eye. His face inscrutable. Impossible to read. I killed him. His voice was as lifeless as death itself, his eyes almost incapable of sympathy, and the moonlight cast an ominous glow on his strong features, revealing his slit eyes. It was Samui's unwavering willpower that stopped her knees from buckling. Visenya took a good sniff in the air. Fear, she smelled. A Cheshire grin played about her lips. Oh, this was going to be fun to watch. Taking a deep breath, Samui charged. Her first sword jab missed as her target took a step backwards, her second strike missed again, and her third, and her fourth, and her fifth. What the, calming her nerves, Samui launched herself in the air and delivered a knee strike right at Naruto's jaw, an attempt to discombobulate him. Swift like a bolt of lightning, Naruto took a step forward to disrupt the assault thrown at him and retaliated by hurling her over his shoulder. What Naruto didn't foresee was Samui cushioning her fall by enwrapping her legs around his neck, performing an arm bar right off the bat and transforming her disadvantage into her unfair advantage. Whoa! You're good, but a lock like that isn't going to kill me. Oh yeah? Samui grinned sadistically as she gave his wrist a sharp twist, reveling in the sickening sound of bone crunching. Much to her chagrin, Naruto didn't flinch. The pain didn't even faze him. Abruptly, Naruto maneuvered his way out of his predicament, found his way atop Samui, seized her hand, and gave it a good yank. The dark velvet sky was filled with Samui's piercing scream, her face gaunt and terrified. Now this is how you break someone's hand. You make sure the hand gets disconnected from the socket. Your enemy will be in so much pain that he won't even know how to fight back and become a mewling fool. The cold, sharp edge of Naruto's sword was placed gently on Samui's neck. It allowed her to conceive her defeat and process the inevitable. Do you know that the human body can withstand a tremendous amount of pain before it ceases to function? You are in luck, because I happen to know a thousand different ways to make you feel pain without dying. So, let us be civil here and do this the easy way. Tell me your name. I will not ask the third time. Conceding to her fate, Samui bit her lower lip. I am Sira Targaryen, forsaken daughter of King Jaehaerys Targaryen the Wise. Visenya balked. T. Targaryen. King Jaehaerys. Hold up. Where in the seven hells is my brother? Isn't he supposed to be king? Samui. Nay. Sira glared daggers at Visenya and spat. Who the is your brother? Aegon Targaryen. Visenya deadpanned. You know? The conqueror? Rider of Balerion? Prince of Dragonstone? Ring any bell? Aegon Targaryen has been dead for 42 years. 40 what now? Visenya snapped at Naruto, who merely shrugged. Explain. Time is warped very differently within Dragon's Keep. An hour there could mean a decade has gone by here. Or a second. I'll tell you more later. 
While Visenya was having an existential crisis, Naruto turned to Sira. So, what is a princess like you doing here? Shouldn't you be dwelling in a castle instead of being a lackey for the faceless men? Why are you not serving your father in Westeros like you're supposed to? Sira growled. If you wish to kill me, then be done with it, I do not owe you my backstory. Underneath the moon's soporific glow, Naruto's crimson eyes looked ever more menacing and inhumane. The faceless men knew better than to come at me. Someone must have paid them handsomely for my head. Who is it? Did the Sea Lord send you to do his bidding? Kill me. Impressive. Not many could stare death in the face and not break. Sarah's eyes reeked of hatred, but she had already made peace with her demons. I have endured far more terrible things in my life than to be afraid of you. I was abandoned by my father. I was a street rat for many moons. I was sold as a slave in Volantis. I was at death's door more than I could count. Trust me when I say this. You do not scare me, Lord Warden. Very well then. Sira Targaryen closed her eyes. Life didn't flash through her mind. Nothing did, really. She had no ties with anybody. No fond memories of anything. She had left nothing behind. Companionship? She didn't have the luxury to enjoy it? Family? Don't make her laugh. Love? What's that? some nonsense parents tell their children at night? In that moment, all she felt was, loneliness. From this day forth, your life is forfeited to me. You will fight and die for me. Now, Sira Targaryen, tell me everything. X. O. X. O. X. Vigo liked his palace tenebrous whenever he needed to hear himself think. The downpour fell on Bravos with a roar, the boom of rolling thunder reverberated throughout the walls. The mere thought of the dragon warden coming for him gave him unadulterated fear. A brilliant shock of white filled the chamber, and then darkness. As the lightning flashed its sudden radiance once more, Vigo saw horror manifested before him. There sat a monster across the table, a mirthless smile tugged at his lips, his eyes were scarlet coals, and his saccharine voice a sweet poison. This is not how I picture myself meeting you, especially not in such circumstances. I believe you know who I am, right? Vigo swallowed hard, is this the part where you kill me? An unsettling pause intruded. Naruto sat quietly, staring like a hawk would to a mouse. Every second they spent in this perturbing silence only made Vigo anxious. The great and mighty sea lord jumped when Naruto dropped his black sword on the table. This sword can kill me. Vigo glanced down at the black sword resting idly before him beads of sweat was forming profusely on his forehead. You know what I am about to do to your son. Naruto's voice was soft and deep, yet dangerous altogether. I am giving you a choice. You can try and kill me with that sword. Or, I walk out of here and gut your son like a fish. Ludicrous. There was no choice to begin with, at least not for Vigo. If he chose the sword, he had no doubt he would lose his head faster than he could blink. Of course, he could put his life on the line but that would mean gambling everything away for his good-for-nothing son's up, if he didn't fight back, his son was good as dead. What kind of choice is that? I hope you're not fighting a war inside you. Naruto stood up and ambled slowly towards Vigo, his gaze unflinching. This is your last chance. Take the sword. Test your luck. See what happens. The turmoil in Vigo tore him apart. His face haggard as he let out a silent scream and he slammed his fists on the table. So what if he was a sea lord? The dragon warden had the world at his mercy. No higher power could contest with that. Naruto rested his hand on Vigo's shoulders and gave it a light squeeze. The most important thing about a wise ruler is integrity. Good values. Giving your people an ideal to strive towards. Help them accomplish wonders. And never forget where you came from. That's why the title of sea lord in Bravos is not inheritable. You have to earn it, just as you did. But, at the end of the day, we are what we are. You have made your choice. Make peace with it, and I will do what I have to do. Is, there anything I can say that will make you change your mind? The cheerful and sinister grin plastered on Naruto's face made Vigo's blood run cold. Can I share a story with you before I go kill your son? It wasn't a question. Once upon a time, a farmer was plowing his field. The lice proved to be a bother to the farmer so he stopped his plowing and purged his jacket. Unfortunately, he was still bitten, and in order for him to be freed by the annoying little lice, he burnt the jacket. 
Naruto leaned down and whispered his threat softly into Vigo's ear. I advise thee who have been humbled once not to make fire necessary the second time. Are we clear? The world was diseased, so the gods sent their champion to purge the evil that infested the lands. He who could not be bought by wealth or women. He who was a hero to the weak and a monster to the wicked. Bards wrote songs about the dragon warden, a man who shall herald a better world out of blood and carnage. A world dedicated for the need for freedom, understanding, and justice. In truth, Naruto had no desire to create a better world. Greater men had tried and failed. Hell, he had done it before and looked how it turned out. Peace never last. In the face of atavistic forces, the world was cursed to live through an incessant cycle of harmony and violence. After all, war gave birth to strong men, strong men ushered peace, peace made weak men, and weak men brought about war. With a black cleaver in his hands, Naruto butchered his way to Yosef's chamber. He took his time, ensuring that Yosef knew he was coming. Like a predator playing with his food, Naruto wanted Yosef to hear the blood curdling screams of his guardsmen. It was psychological warfare at its finest. Yosef knew his doom was inevitable. There was no place to hide, no divine powers to absolve him from his sins, no redemption for his deeds. Humming a jolly tune, Naruto took jaunty steps as he evaded a spear thrust from a guard. Futile. Why did they even bother to try? Clicking his tongue in disapproval, Naruto swung his cleaver and beheaded the fool. Two more men decided to try their luck. Two more heads dropped to the cobblestone floor. This is not something I enjoy doing. Naruto wiped the blood off his ebony blade on the cloak of one of the dead guards. His gaze, however, was fixated on those who were alive. But I think Basenya is rubbing off on me. The guards were wary, but grew smart in this horrid battle. One on one fight was suicidal. Five on one, and they might hold a chance. Naruto knew what the guards were thinking and beckoned them with a curling finger. His gaze unblinking as one of the guards broke formation, probably out of fear. Anticipating the haphazard sword strikes coming his way, Naruto dodged with grace, grabbed the poor sap by his neck, slammed him to a brick wall, and plunged his cleaver right into his throat. Naruto stared into his victim's soul and watched as life faded away from his eyes, as if guiding him to the afterlife. With nonchalance, Naruto tossed the corpse aside and turned to the trembling guards, who were paralyzed by consternation. Their blood ran cold as Naruto started twirling his cleaver dangerously with a finger. My beef is not with you. Step aside and I'll spare you. Serve your lord and I'll send you to your gods. Jerking a thumb over his shoulder, Naruto grinned, showcasing his handiwork. Mutilated corpses scattered all over the hall. Blood splattered the white marble wall red and the foul stench of death permeated the air. Well? Pity, really, that good men had to die for a swine. The guards let out one last war cry, raised their swords, and ran towards impossible odds. For their bravery, Naruto would honor them with a death worthy of their fortitude. Naruto leapt into the air, his black cleaver morphed into a halberd, and he brought it down unforgivingly upon his foe. Fountain of blood and gore gushed out as his victim were bifurcated in half. Without hesitation, Naruto lifted his halberd with Herculean might and swung it once more, slicing through steel, flesh, and bones like hot knife through butter. The many-faced god had a hearty reaping that night. Have you been holding back in our spar all this time? Visenya emerged from the shadows, flabbergasted by the bloodshed that was wrought by her master. Sira had seen her fair share of senseless murders, but nothing quite like this. As a professional assassin, she kept her composure well. Holding back, Naruto chuckled softly. Oh, my sweet summer child, you have no idea what I can do. Visenya snorted. Is this going to come back and bite you in the ass? What do you mean? You are going to kill the Sea Lord's son, surely there are consequences. Did you think about consequences when you step on an ant? Naruto countered. At any rate, it's getting late. Let's wrap this up real quick. It came with no surprise when Naruto kicked the door off its hinges and found Yosef cowering underneath his bed, muttering incoherently. What a disappointment, really. Naruto expected a fight at the very least. Egotistical and abrasive cunt like Yosef tyrannized his subjects to feed on his delusions for grandeur, but when the chips were down, all of their false bravado would drop like flies. Fifty of your men died for you. Do you have anything to say about that? F off, M my father will have your head. Do you hear me? 
Naruto blinked. I went to him before I came here, actually. I offered him a chance to kill me. Granted, that chance is too slim to be even considered as such, but it is still a chance nevertheless. To preserve his title as Sea Lord or die fighting for his son. Do you want to know what his choice was? When realization dawned on Yosef, his frame trembled frantically. Do not be scared. I take no pleasure in murdering people. Naruto smiled with a lifeless mirth, yet his voice was sweet as honey. Come out now. I will not hurt you, I promise. After all, I never go back on my word. Believe it. Perhaps it was Naruto's hypnotic smile and his melodic voice that carried an assurance to his claims, but Yosef's body acted on its own volition. Slowly, but surely, he crawled his way out of his bed and stood up, albeit groggily. Naruto took a step forward, but that invoked a horrible flinch from Yosef. If I wished to hurt you, I would have done so the moment I found you. There was no argument to that logic. Naruto rested a hand on Yosef's shoulder, a sinister grin curled up his lips. Look into my eyes. What do you see? At first, Yosef saw a pair of gentle blue eyes, but then his vision became bruised. Reality crumbled like a house of cards and he was swallowed by a sheet of darkness. When he came to, he found himself in an alleyway. W what's going on? Why was he sniffing the dumpster? W wait, did he become a dog? When he glanced up, fear consumed him. He saw an apparition of himself staring sadistically back at him, and then the memory struck him painfully. He was only eight when he scampered along the decrepit streets and found a skinny dog scavenging for scraps. In a moment of rash impulse, he grabbed a blunt weapon and beat the dog to death, it made him felt powerful. But, what was this madness? Why did he become the dog? He tried to run, but he saw his eight year old self seizing a nearby club and chasing after him. There was no escape, he was too hungry to run, move, damn it. No matter how much he screamed at himself, his body wouldn't budge. When the blow struck his face, fire seared through his body. It was like his face had exploded from the impact. The second blow came so fast, skull brutally smashed in and meat spew out everywhere. What was left of him was a grotesque, twitching mess. Darkness, black as a sinner's soul, devoured him once more. And a flicker of light shone on his face. This time, he found himself cramped underneath a shrub, his breaths labored as he looked around frantically. Was he in a forest? From afar, he heard wolves howling and dread coiled in his stomach. This happened when he was at his fifteenth name day. To satisfy his perverse fantasy, he tied a string of meat around a peasant's neck, threw said peasant in a godforsaken forest, and set loose the hungry wolves. Now the tormentor became the tormented. Yosef tried to make a dash for it, but his clumsiness caused him to trip over branches. As he hissed in pain, the wolves swiveled around and looked at him. Oh, no, menacing red eyes were reeking with bloodlust, their intention clear as day. Stay back, he screamed his lungs out. Backpedaling, he could only let out a guttural croak before the beasts pounced on him, tearing him limb from limb. His choked scream was cut short when one of the wolves went for his jaw. This was hell. Make it stop, please, make it stop. Make it stop, Yosef blinked in the darkness once more. And the damnable light cast its ray on him, this time promising yet another nightmare. Meanwhile, Naruto dusted his hands, satisfied with his work. Visenya and Sira were confused by what had unfolded before them. A few seconds ago, Yosef was staring into Naruto's eyes, but things escalated quickly. Yosef let out a shrill gasp and abruptly sank into his knees, defecating and convulsing. What in the seven frigging hell happened? I find a swift death too pleasant for him. Naruto strode past his apprentices with nonchalance, gesturing them to follow him out of the chamber. As we speak, he is experiencing the life of every victim that he has murdered, raped, and tortured. He will relive it over and over again until his body ceases to function. Visenya blanched. That is too much, no? If he is a saint, then he wouldn't be in a mess right now. He is reaping what he has sowed. You did promise him that you wouldn't hurt him. And I deliver on that promise. I didn't hurt him. Karma did. A terrifying chill crawled up Sarah's spine as she bore witness to what the Dragon Warden could do. It was inconceivable to think that such a hellish torture existed, not to mention, she tried to assassinate him just a few hours ago. This could very well be her fate. Clamping a hand over her mouth to stifle her gasp, 
Sira turned to Naruto, horror plastered on her beautiful face. Her facade of indifference that she always wore now shattered. Why you're a monster? No, she didn't intend to blurt that out, it was unintentional. Terror shook Sarah's entire body when Naruto spun around, his smile treacherously kind as he caressed her flushed cheek. Return to the house of black and white. Tell them what happened. Tell them, that death has to wait a little longer. Let them know you have sworn fealty to me. You are now a dragon warden, from this day till your last day. Sarah wasn't sure how to digest this, but her voice had regained its frostiness. A faceless man never fails, failure means death. A faceless man has no identity, yet you still cling on to your heritage. Do you understand now? You never were a faceless man to begin with. Don't be afraid when you deliver the news. The faceless men would not attempt to bestow their gift on you. They don't take lives without an exorbitant compensation. It wasn't very persuasive, but it made sense regardless. I will pick you up from the temple tomorrow. X. O. X. O. X. The inn was a tranquil refuge with rooms lavishly furnished. Basenya wanted the room with a mezzanine that offered a stellar view of the ocean. The soothing sound of crashing waves set the ambience for the night. Exhausted, Naruto collapsed on the bed with a hand over his eyes. He would have drifted to sleep if it wasn't for the sudden weight dropped on his hips. When he opened his eyes, he almost choked. A very naked and beautiful Visenya was straddling him, a sultry grin played about her lips. The moonlight perfectly cast its glow on her curvilinear waist, her milky white skin, and nebulous violet eyes, she was truly elegance personified. V Visenya. Hush. She bent down, her eyes gleaming with the promise of ecstasy. As long as Naruto submitted to his desire, she would give herself to him. Their lips were inches apart. Any man would have savored Visenya's mad lust but Naruto knew better. Lust could never dictate his actions, because he still hadn't dealt with his demons yet. His eyes locked on hers, stopping her advance. Do you really love Hinata so much? She died for me? I'll die for you. Their time together in Dragon's Keep wasn't all fine and dandy. There were days when they argued, fought, parted, agonized, and reconciled. All these ups and downs made their lives more vibrant. Visenya wanted to fight her way to Naruto's lips, but it felt as if her body was tied down by the invisible threads of what ifs. What if he rejected her? What if she wasn't good enough for him? What if he had never loved her to begin with? Naruto wrapped his hands around her and gave her forehead a gentle kiss. The kiss, unbearably fragile, sent a spike of sensation coursing through Visenya's veins. All her thoughts about who she was, her insecurities, and her desires became irrelevant. This moment, tender and delicate, was beautiful as it was and she couldn't ask for anything more. As she rested her face on his sculpted chest, hearing his rhythmic heartbeat, bliss overwhelmed her. I know, he said softly. Then an epiphany struck Visenya. Why don't you grant me immortality? I can live alongside you. Only a mad man wants immortality. No, life was a gift, but immortality a curse. You have no idea what you're wishing for. Immortality is a fate worse than death. You will be forced to watch all you care about grow old and die, and there is nothing you can do about it. It will drive you to the brink of insanity. As long as I'm with you, I'm not afraid, but I am. Naruto's voice, though weary, was adamant about his conviction. This is not a fate that I will want you to have. You don't make this decision for me. A man could never stand seeing the woman he loved hurt. If the decisions he had made came out as selfish, then so be it, but it would be done so that he would never be responsible for her pain. He had experienced heartache once, and it almost destroyed him. This was Visenya's impulsiveness talking, she just didn't know it yet. She just, we'll talk about this some other day. When will that day be? Naruto chuckled. Impatient now, are we? If you don't want to talk about that, then enlighten me about the dragon transformation magic. At that, Naruto's eyes widened like saucer. Did you sneak into my library again? Visenya giggled impishly. I am a bit of a vagabond. Besides, library is built to let people in and read books, no? What do you want to know? Is it possible to learn this power, to become a dragon? I. Visenya narrowed her eyes, her fingers tracing circles around his chest. There is a, but, isn't it? The dragon transformation magic was formulated by Naruto after excessive trial and errors. To warp into a dragon required unparalleled focus and a great reserve of power to do so. 
After all, this was no parlor trick. Cells had to be mutated at an atomic level, bones had to expand exponentially, and flesh had to be augmented rigorously to support tons of load. The science behind it was too sophisticated to explain to Visenya, even in layman's terms. You are not ready yet. So when will I be ready? She asked with zeal. It was already disheartening enough for Visenya to know that she couldn't breathe fire, but this solution could very well be her salvation. Just imagine the possibilities. Riding a dragon was one thing, but being a dragon, now that was a whole new mountain of crazy. Pinching the bridge of his nose, Naruto sighed. You need to sharpen your mind. The spell is easy to craft, but difficult to control. If you take the form of a dragon, your mind will not be ready for the backlash. The instincts to kill. The instinct to destroy. You wouldn't be able to control it. Once you taste the bloodlust that all dragons do, nothing will ever sedate your thirst. You might not be able to turn back. So what do you propose I do? Visenya moaned as Naruto held her tighter. Enveloped in the heat of his embrace, she melted instantly. I propose we go to sleep. We have a long day ahead. There you go again. Changing the subject. Are you going to change the subject if I ask you about Sira? A snore escaped Naruto's lips, much to Visenya's annoyance. She hit him playfully in his chest and growled. I know you're not sleeping. Heaving out a deliberately loud sigh, Naruto opened a lazy eye and grumbled. What about her? Why did you spare her? She did try to kill you. She wielded magic without knowing. That's talent. Besides, she is related to you in some way, no? Visenya almost shuddered. She looks like she's only a few years younger than I am. Is that a problem? It's weird. I mean, if I haven't come to Dragon's Keep, I would be in Westeros. Most likely married to a man I do not love. I'll probably be cranky, deceitful, and full of hate. You told me before about this, haven't you? The Targaryen practiced incest? That you're supposed to marry your brother? What's that all about? Visenya blanched. It's complicated. Traditions, I suppose. Apparently, the Targaryen aren't the only great house that practices it. Most, if not all great houses in Old Valyria practice incest. Keeps the bloodline pure, so they say. I think it has something to do with dragon bonding. How peculiar, huh? Taking in Naruto's scent of sage and mandarin, Visenya closed her eyes. Sleep was already claiming her. To be in the arms of someone she loved and not cared about anything else was more than enough for her. Heaven was a place on earth with him. X. O. X. O. X halo of golden shimmers poured into the bedroom. The warmth of the morning sun roused Naruto awake and he saw something magnificent. The radiance shone with irresistible prejudice in Visenya's favor, highlighting every detail of her that made her otherworldly. Visenya's eyelid fluttered open, surprising Naruto. Did you dream about me last night? Were you awake this whole time? Visenya responded with a hint of laughter playing on her lips. You snore louder than Vogger. Did not? Naruto actually looked offended by that statement. I'll have you know that it is impossible for me to snore louder than Vogger or any dragon of her size for that matter. Why so defensive? She teased, half in delight, half in mischief. A pillow flew right into her Visenya's face, triggering a pillow fight. Their boisterous laughter and purrs were music to the ears and neither of them was willing to give in. And then Visenya pushed Naruto back to their bed, pinning his hands above his head. Neither one of them blinked as they stared intensely at each other. Sparks of fiery passion drove her to her edge, her heart roaring in her chest, here goes nothing. Visenya sought his mouth with a hungering kiss, her fingertips passing over the strong lines of his cheekbones, and jaw, the taut sinew of his neck. The smell of his skin intoxicated her with every breath. The taste of his mouth, the feel of his solid body, their desires exploded felt immeasurably exciting. A pleasurable ache swelled in her stomach. Suddenly, she could not kiss him hard enough, long enough. As Naruto felt her escalating wildly, he forcibly eased her back, ignoring her whimpers of protest. His own breath hitched, and it seemed to disorientate his thoughts. Visenya, he touched her reddened cheek, a thumb tracing along the bridge of her nose. I'm sorry. Why? Visenya's voice cracked. Do you even know how much I love you? War had hardened Visenya's spirit, compelling her to cocoon herself in a husk of recluse in order to be strong. That was her upbringing, an upbringing her father had demanded fervently. Even her siblings called her the Ice Queen, but that wasn't her. 
she didn't think she would find a man who could free her from her shackles and show her what it was like to be truly alive. The joy of realizing she wanted to spend the rest of her life with him, by the gods, she had even dreamt of their wedding. This moment made her realize that whilst she was utterly overwhelmed by her intense passion, he could restrain himself. How did he even resist her? Was she not attractive enough for him? No, how could she demean him like this? Naruto never saw her beauty as her redeeming quality. It would be superficial. Strength, determination, and an iron clad will appeal to him more than anything. However, what happened next had stunned her. Naruto kissed her slowly, deeply, licking into her silky recesses of her mouth. Basenya's shoulders stiffened as she felt her skin suddenly becoming sensitive, her body tingled by his gentle caress and she couldn't help but groan with pleasure. Time seemed to stop as she felt his fingers tangling in her hair. His affection, this love, her need, everything started to become clear to her. As their lips parted, their foreheads touched. This is not fair for you, he said in a rough whisper. You still love her? The love Naruto had for his deceased wife had now become a horror. Pang of guilt would struck his beating heart. Like a thousand knives lacerating his soul. Whenever he closed his eyes. Knowing that he couldn't protect his wife from being possessed by that nefarious witch, and becoming a monster, it broke him. He had to kill the woman he loved. A part of him died inside, making it impossible for him to mend himself together. Every time Naruto felt his heart beating for Visenya, a bile of fear would smother him. Paralyzing him. Mocking him. And he'll see visions of his wife dying in his hands. Naruto's stupor was disrupted when he felt Visenya's smooth fingers wiping off the tears rolling down his downtrodden eyes. I was a failure as a husband. I couldn't even save her. Hearing Naruto's confession tore Visenya's heart apart. Whatever tragedy that had traumatized him had brought him to heal. It also made her realize something crucial. People saw the Dragon Warden as destruction incarnate, but that's not what he truly was. Naruto wasn't perfect. He made mistakes, his past made him vulnerable, but that was his foundation, it was what made him human. Wrapping her hands around Naruto's neck, she pulled him to her. I won't leave you, Naruto. You still have me. The dragons. Dragons keep. Everything. If you want to live, to truly live, you need to let it go. Let the past go. Forgive yourself and move on. Huddling against her soft bosom, Naruto shut his eyes. Forgive myself? Otherwise you can never truly be alive. You'll be too afraid to love, and when you do, you expect to fail. You expect everything to fall apart. That is not living, my love. You are giving the past too much power over you. Basenya cooed softly as she held him. It won't be an easy journey, but I'm going to be there for you. Every step of the way, I'll pick you up when you're down. They were made for each other, she knew it so, she loved him. If only he could say those three words to her too. X. O. X. O. X. If the vicissitude of life had taught Sira something, it was never to look a gift horse in the mouth. The Dragon Warden had offered her a chance to a new life, an opportunity to be part of something spectacular, and opportunity usually comes like a snail, but once it passed, it would flee like a fleet rabbit. This was a godsend. Surprisingly, the faceless men did not hold her in contempt. They acknowledged her departure with smiles, nothing more and nothing less. Sira Targaryen stood at the promenade outside the Temple of Black and White, overseeing the crystal blue ocean. From the distance, she could see the dragon's silhouettes within steel gray clouds. She was ready for her new life. The mighty dragons descended before her and the impact shook the ground. Sira couldn't help but gawk at them in awe and fascination. Instruments of war and weapons of mass destruction. Any one of these dragons could wipe out an army in a blink of an eye. It was no wonder why the Targaryen could reign over Westeros for so many years. The dragon warden climbed down from the back of his black drake smiling toothily at her. How are you, Sira Targaryen? I'm copacetic. Sira reciprocated with a small smile. Is that even a word? Visenya quipped, the annoyance in her voice was discernible. Naruto's smile remained unfaltering. Are you ready? If I may, Sira straightened her back. I would like to be called, Samui. Naruto raised a brow. Why is that? Sira is a cursed name. I was abandoned when I was Sira Targaryen. Adrift in this mad world. Lost and afraid. I found my identity as Samui in Volantis. And I have lived my life as Samui ever since. 
Clicking his tongue, Naruto shook his head. Samui represents your identity as a slave. A dragon warden is no slave. You may despise your heritage, but it is the reason why you are standing here. Destiny has spun its tread of fate using the name, Sira Targaryen. You will come to respect that name one day. Sira sighed and shifted her sight to an impassive Visenya, who was a top vogger. The dress of fawn colored silk that she was wearing stood out like a sore thumb. That dress doesn't look practical. Sarah's candor irked Visenya. Naruto made a muffled, laughing noises. Seems like I'm not the only one who thought the same. Visenya shot Naruto a glance of veiled anger, who pretended not to notice. For your information, I can kick your ass while wearing this dress. You might tear that dress in battle though, Sira responded dryly. Hey, I do whatever I want, Visenya huffed. This walking pair of cow teats dared criticize her fashion choice. Where in the seven hell did Sira get her hubris from? No, Visenya refused to put up with this shenanigan. Once they had gotten back to Dragon's Keep, Visenya would instill some discipline into Sira. That being said, Naruto had miscalculated one thing. Sira had no means of getting to Dragon's Keep. Vagar was her dragon. She would sooner chop off her arms than let Sira ride with her. As for Alduin, that's self explanatory. Anyway, how is she going to get to Dragon's Keep? Sira blinked. By a boat? Naruto and Visenya shared a look with each other for a moment, before they burst out laughing. Dragon's Keep was an impregnable stronghold, guarded by a perpetual fog that dissuade invaders. Any sailors worth their salt knew better than to explore uncharted territory. Only a dragon could reach Dragon's Keep, but Sira wouldn't know that. Did I say something wrong? It is almost impossible to get to Dragon's Keep by a boat, my dear. Naruto stepped aside and pivoted his body, offering Sira a majestic view of Alduin. Sira, this is Alduin. A high dragon. Alduin, meet Sira Targaryen. She is part of our family now. Will you do be so kind as to let her ride on you? We really need to get back home. You're our only hope. Like a child throwing a temper tantrum, Alduin growled viciously at Sira. Visenya snickered, knowing how this would end. Naruto, however, was patient with Alduin. Like a father would to his petulant child. There, there. I taught you better. Alduin shook his head vehemently and bared his fangs. This aggressive behavior however aggravated Naruto. I don't want to hear this. Hey, look at me. Alduin. Oi. Look at me. The black dragon let out a shattering roar. Oi. Don't start acting up, do you hear me? The dragon crooned, then made frustrated whines. Flames even blew out from his nostrils. I want an inside voice up here, hey, don't you jibe with me, boy? Is this how we behave? It was borderline comical for Sira to witness a glorious beast wailing like a bratty child. Any grown man would have soiled themselves before Alduin's massive maw, but not Naruto. He stared the dragon down, as if daring the harbinger of death to try something funny with him. Naruto petted Alduin's snout, his gaze softened. Be a good boy. Give Sira a ride home. Just this once, okay. It would be a miracle if Alduin conceded, Visenya mused. Dragons were stubborn for their own good. If a dragon was adamant about wanting something dead, they would fight tooth and nail just to get it done. After all, dragons perceived the expurgation of humanity as sport. Just as Visenya had predicted, Alduin refused to bend his neck for anybody but Naruto. Conceding to Alduin's demand with an exhausted sigh, Naruto scratched his head sheepishly and gave Sira an apologetic look. I guess there is no changing Alduin's mind. It would seem that Sira might really need a boat after all. Visenya cackled uproariously and crudely at Sira's plight. Ah, the triumph. Visenya always preferred her dish of vengeance to be served piping hot. That wouldn't be necessary. Naruto's face cracked into a sly grin. I am about to do something that I have not done for years. Do me a favor, will you? Sira blinked. Don't scream. Suddenly, a ruthless storm hit the whole of Bravos with great fury. The fire from perdition erupted from beneath Naruto, engulfing him in molten lava. Charring and blazing, the inferno grew ravenous, devouring Naruto whole. A blast of black smoke shot up, smothering the air with confetti of ember and then they heard a terrible grumble. There were things mankind couldn't fight. Acts of God were one of them, but this, 
What Basenya and Sira had witnessed that day had made them realize one thing, if they didn't believe in the existence of God, they do so now. From the darkest nightmare, a dragon rose from the abyss, its unfurled wings were so massive they eclipsed the sun as the great beast stood on its hind legs, its height rivaled the titan of bravos. Nine serpentine tails pierced through the auburn sky, each possessed the destructive power to flatten mountains and evoke tsunami. With its outstretched talons, it could squash elephants like they were mere toys, a tantamount to its impeccable might. Then it threw back its head, opened its jagged maw, and let out a thunderous roar, unleashing a rippling shockwave so powerful, it split the seas in half, so deafening, it drowned out the thunderclaps. No religion could envision such a behemoth. The fallacy of man was believing that gods of epic proportions could be comprehended. This was the living embodiment of destruction that could shake the heavens and tore the earth asunder. There was nothing more terrifying to know that, should the day comes, no force could rise up against this insurmountable adversity. A deity amongst dragons who could herald the extinction of mankind on a whim. Fork of white lightning struck the earth unforgivingly, their intensity met only by the great dragon's unfathomable power. Gazing upon his cruel slit eyes that burned with a frightening malevolence, Vagar and Alduin instinctively bent down submissively before the colossal monstrosity. While Sira was mortified, Visenya was amazed. Could this be the pinnacle of magic? Would she be able to do the same as well? W. What? Sira staggered, but who could blame her? Are you the dragon warden? Though unmoving, the dragon glanced down, scrutinizing, nay, judging everything beneath him, and then it lowered itself, as if beckoning Sira to climb atop him. Letting out her hitched breath, Sira mustered her courage and scaled the dragon. When she steadied her wobbliness, she leaned down and patted the dragon's nape. I am ready. The ungodly red dragon blasted off skyward, stirring dirt and whirling in his wake. The fleeting beauty of a rose was like life itself. It would wither away, eventually. All beautiful things do. That's why Visenya felt a thorn prickling her heart when she saw Sira smiling alongside Naruto. She knew better than to be jealous, but she couldn't stop thinking about what ifs. They clicked almost instantly. Sira was gregarious and Naruto was open-hearted. Visenya's sigh puffed out a steam of warm breath, whisked away in the stiff, cold wind. The sunrise bloomed in Dragon's Keep, tinting the snow-drenched mountain with bright orange and red. Whenever she felt perturbed, she would take a stroll along the ranch, feed the cattle in the farm, and take in the fresh morning air. The trip to Bravo's was supposed to be rejuvenating, not disappointing. That being said, it got her thinking. What if she were to rule Essos? The entire continent was governed by slavery. Women were degraded, their dignity denied as they were slaves. Children were shackled by the chains of tyranny and oppression. Why was kindness such a rare commodity in this world? How could the gods etch suffering into reality? Could she do something about it? From time to time, Visenya would persuade Naruto to use his powers for good, make the world a better place. After all, if there was anybody who could save the world from the cruelty of men, it was him. But he always gave her a level look and become taciturn. Humanity is diseased, kill them all, Visenya blinked, was she hearing voices? Something bothering you, Visenya? Snapping back to reality, Visenya turned to Naruto, who stood on the doorway. Sira was admiring the extravagance of the house, her jaw unhinged. Atop the plateau situated between River's Valley stood a modest house of wood and glass. The walls were latticed with ivy, reaching to the balconies. Within the sanctuary was an atrium with spiral staircases, supported by the finest oak beams. A dome of glass in the ceiling allowed pillar of light into the hall, but what caught Sarah's eyes were the archway above her. The stone was carved with hundreds of dragons each one more breathtaking and spectacular than the last. The two of you live here? Sira asked. Naruto smiled. Visenya didn't quite like living like a hermit, so I built this place for her. Now you will be staying here with her too. What about you? What about me? Naruto blinked. You said that this house is built for Lady Visenya. Sira tilted her head, confusion marred her face. You never mention anything about yourself. At that, Naruto chuckled. The whole of Dragon's Keep is my home. Sarah's mouth formed a silent circle. Anyway, Visenya will show you around. Once you have settled in, she'll give you a tour around Dragon's Keep. Well, you won't get to see all of it, but you'll get a rough picture. Naruto smiled. 
The magic saturation is dense in here. Your body will be drunken by its power, strengthening your core, your skin, and your senses. The atmosphere in Dragon's Keep is nourishing and clean. You will grow stronger here. Giving his limbs a good stretch, Naruto beamed at Visenya. Bring Sira to the sword grave once you finish the tour with her. She is in desperate need of a new weapon. Sira blinked. What's wrong with my weapon? Naruto's attention trailed down to Sarah's waist. Amusement sparkled in his ocean blue eyes as he examined the thin blade. It looked like he could snap it like a twig. Shaking his head, Naruto quipped. You won't be able to intimidate a dragon with that, thing of yours. Trust me, I'll see you there. Quick on her toes, Visenya ambled to Naruto, grabbed his face between her hands, cradling his cheeks tenderly, and kissed him. Violently. Desires exploded in her as she moaned sultrily when he returned the kiss. Their sound of passion reverberated through their bodies. Visenya made sure to cast sidelong glance at Sira, as if marking Naruto her property. And then he broke off the kiss. Brushing a lock of lustrous golden hair behind Visenya's ear, Naruto's comely features softened into a warm smile. We should exercise restraint, my dear. Of course, master. Visenya winked. In a blink of an eye, Naruto's form dissipated into a cloud of smoke. X. O. X. O. X. Welcome to Dragon's Keep. First rule of the game. Don't wander anywhere without supervision. See that mountain over there? Visenya pointed at the mountain with a white peak from afar. Don't let its beauty fool you. The entire mountain is the nest of an old dragon. It goes by many names. Dolomiter, Jormungand, Midgard Sormer. Master said it was much older than even the dawn of the first men. It has a maw that can gobble up a whale. Sira gaped. Wow. That's really huge. Yup. Visenya opened her hands, showcasing her alpaca farm. One of the alpacas galloped to Visenya and gave her a gentle nudge on her shoulder. It looked just like a ball of brown, smiling cloud. And this is my pet project. They are not food, mind you. Bogger or their foster mother, so anybody who messes with my alpaca, messes with my dragon. You have been warned. The fact that Vogger took up the mantle of surrogate mother for the alpacas spoke volumes about dragon's intelligence. It would seem that the maternal instinct of a dragon could override its impulse to kill. How fascinating. Nevertheless, Sira realized something was amiss. Sure, alpaca were cute, fluffy things with a splash of pony, but it was a surprise that they weren't considered livestock. Judging by the horde of dragons she saw soaring through the sky, she reckoned they must eat a lot. Don't judge. I love alpaca, and you should too. Visenya pointed at a tree. And that's another tree. And another. And another. Oh. We're stepping on grass. The sky is blue. You don't have that in Essos. That kissing stunt back then, the palpable sarcasm and subtle venom laced in Visenya's tone were signs. It didn't take a genius to know that Visenya dreaded being friendly with Sira. Sira sighed. You don't seem to be interested in giving me a tour. No, I don't. As a matter of fact, I don't like you too. Visenya snapped. I was Naruto's first disciple. His only disciple. We understood each other. I was there for him when he needs me. And he was there for me. Things are going great. And then you showed up, tried to kill him, and failed miserably. Oh, Sira could smell jealousy from miles away. Perhaps a little teasing might break the ice between them, or so she thought. You think I will steal him away from you? Psychotic rage blazed across Visenya's violet eyes and she unsheathed Dark Sister. In a fraction of a second, Visenya was behind Sira. Cold Valyrian steel met sumptuous neck. I think a formal introduction is in order. I am Visenya Targaryen, conqueror of Westeros and servant to Dragon's Keep. I tend to the cattle, I clean up caves, and I also enjoy killing ignorant, self-centered twats like yourself. Unfazed by the murderous threat, Sira responded with a dauntless grin. I do apologize if you felt threatened by me. However, I am not delusional to think that I am better than you. You are clearly more powerful than I am. And you have a dragon. It won't even be an even fight. Visenya's eyes hardened. 1. Do not presume that I am threatened by the likes of you. 2. Do not presume that you will ever be better than me. A fight? How dare a prey think she is worthy to fight me? Just because we drink the same water and share the same ancestry, it does not make us anything alike. Although cow and snake drink water, 
one only makes milk and the other produces poison. Which one do you think you are? Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. A perfect narration of what Visenya embodied. Frankly, Sira never underestimated Visenya's prowess. Tough, badass, and dangerous, the Targaryen eulogized Visenya as a no-nonsense heroine who was feared even by Aegon Targaryen himself. Now, I do not care who the hell you are or where you came from, and I sure as hell am not interested with your life story. All I need from you is your dedication and devotion to the Dragon's Keep. If I can't get that, you can swim back to where we found you. Do I make myself clear, Sira Targaryen? Sira had met many egotistical assholes in her life, but Visenya sure took the cake. That being said, Sira knew she still had much to learn from Visenya. The last thing she wanted would be to piss her off too much. Yes, my lady. I apologize for my misdemeanor. Excellent. Visenya broke into a smile, as if she didn't just threaten to disembowel Sira, and withdrew her sword. Now that we have established our boundaries, let us continue the tour. If you must know, Dragon's Keep is guarded by the Yanryute. It means. Four Dragon Emperor. Sira interjected, much to Visenya's surprise. I studied the ancient language of the Ashai a few years ago. As much as I don't care about other people's business, I will have you know that I once fought alongside two of my finest lieutenants and never learned their names. Visenya strolled alongside Sira into the woods. Alduin guards the north of Dragon's Keep, which makes him one of the Yanryute. Pray that you won't meet the rest of the bunch. They are not very friendly. In fact, Alduin tolerates us because his respect for Master triumphs his hatred for everything else. When will I get my dragon? Visenya raised a brow and resisted her urge to roll her eyes. You speak of dragon bonding as if it is a ritual to control them. It is a relationship. It involves mutual respect. When the time comes and you find your destined dragon, it will all make sense. X. O. X. O. X. Pitter patter. The rain had stopped but the granite sky still cast a blanket of shadow over Dragon's Keep. Naruto sat with a knee tucked close to his chest, a dozen of infant dragons nestled around his lap. While their mother was out hunting, he would drop by to keep the defenseless hatchlings safe. A kaleidoscope of white and violet butterflies swirled in the air, dancing their hypnotic ritual. Time seemed to have stop in motion and the world became a dome of monochrome. The voice, saccharine and melodic, yet so sorrowful at the same time, echoed within the cavern. You look happier, Naruto-kun. How could he forget that voice? The voice that he was in love with. A voice that once gave him a reason to live and made him strong. It was bittersweet when at last and Naruto glanced down, the shadows masked his eyes, am I? It's time to move on. But how? The pain never went away. Sitting at the highest peak of the mountain, basking in the warmth of the summer sun, stealing kisses in their giggles, and watching sunrise replace the moon. It was beautiful. Irreplaceable. Like a beautiful dream. And now she was gone. His happiness was given to him like a blessing and ripped away so cruelly. You know I can't ever be happier without you. Fall for someone new. Guilt had eaten him away. There was no remedy to absolve from his deeds. He had murdered the woman he had loved. A selfless woman who had loved him unconditionally and believed in him, even when nobody did. For the sake of mankind's survival, he did what nobody bare to do. Perhaps that was why he couldn't bring himself to care about the plight that plagued men. Was it really worth it? To trade my life for a billion innocent lives? You know that answer more than I do, Naruto-kun. At what cost though? In his heart of hearts, all he wanted was some closure. To embrace her once more, feel the warmth of her skin, take in the lavender scent of hers that he was so familiar with, and tell her one last time. He loved her. Naruto opened his palm and watched as a white butterfly unfolded its wings. If you truly love me, then find happiness. As the passage of time resumed its flow, the warm breeze blew in Naruto's face, thick with the scent of damp leaves and last night's storm. And then a foreboding feeling struck him. Naruto cursed. In a blink of an eye, he was gone. X. O. X. O. X. The forest of death, though antiquated and otherworldly wasn't as ominous as it sounded. Sira mused to herself. The trees were centuries old, if their mottled bark and sprawling limbs were anything to go by. She'd expected monsters lurking in the shadows, not scuttling rabbits in a river of living turquoise. Why is it called the forest of death? 
because it is the region closest to the fourteen flames. Once upon a time, the fourteen flames were living mountains with veins of molten lava and hearts of fire, but the dragon warden came and extinguished the heat. Now, they lay dormant, waiting patiently for the end to come. And also, this forest is the nest to hundreds of dragons. You could say it is the most dangerous place in the world. Sira found herself breathless when she spotted a dragon from afar. Its roar thundered across the hill and shook the puddle on the sodden earth. Flames belched from its nostrils as it snapped its attention at Visenya and Sira. Take one step back and this guy will make you his lunch. That is Madir, the Dark Eater. His strength is more or less equal to Alduin's. The south of Dragon's Keep is under his care. Visenya crossed her hands. He has a nasty temper. Really territorial in nature. Despises anything that comes near his turf. The only reason he isn't hostile is because he recognizes Dragon Wardens, so it's best to tread lightly. Sira glanced up at the magnificent beast before her. Men were born with the innate fear of calamity, but Sira couldn't help but imagine riding Madir into battle. All of a sudden, she could fight Hurricane. The exhilaration that coursed through Sarah's vein made her realize one thing. She felt a connection with Madir. It was very much like a tug, like a tingling feeling that gave her goosebumps, but no matter how inconspicuous and horrifying it was, it was there. Instinctively, she unsheathed her sword, much to Visenya's chagrin. What the hell are you doing? Put that sword back. I'm going to make Madir mine. Sira pivoted and shot Visenya a grin. You fool. You can't possibly think you can stand up against a dragon? Everybody has to start somewhere. Wish me luck, fearlessly, and to Visenya's dismay, Sira let out a war cry and charged blindly at Madir. That crazy bitch. Visenya steeled her nerves, her nose crinkling. This was not going to end well for both of them. At first, Madir didn't pay Sira any mind. After all, to an almighty dragon, what could a mere mortal do? When she leapt into the sky, hoisted her blade in the air, and smashed it against Madir's black scales, the boundary between impertinence and transgression had been crossed. Sira gawked when her blade shattered like glass. If it wasn't for her cartwheels, she would have been flattened by Madir's tail. A million simulations came to Visenya's mind. Rush in, avoid Madir's ravaging attacks, grab Sira, and make a run for it. Damn it, even she wasn't strong enough to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a dragon of Madir's caliber. If she survived this, she was going to. Don't, Visenya's eyes widened, let that bitch die. That disturbing, eerie voice was frigid and deathlike. Was it, a hallucination? Black plume of smoke gushed out from Madir's jaw. Suddenly, its eyes radiated a bright blue. Then the smokes lit up into hellish flames, burning and devouring everything haphazardly. Sira involuntarily took a few steps back. It wouldn't be that hard to keep herself out of the raging inferno's reach, but things escalated quickly after that. The fire concentrated into a beam of pandemonium and it struck the ground, cutting a deep furrow in the earth as it continued to sweep forward. Trees and rocks were vaporized in an instance. A brilliant flash of light momentarily blinded Sira, who had to shield her eyes with her forearm. All she could hear was ear splitting explosions detonating all around her. When she managed to creak open an eye, her eyes widened like saucers. Naruto stood protectively before her, his outstretched hand pushed against Madir's snout. I told you, didn't I? Your weapon won't intimidate a dragon. You are not ready to take on Madir yet. I, in the midst of its rampage, Madir had lost its sanity. All it saw was red. With ferocious intent, Madir swiped its claw at Naruto, startling Sira. Everything went to hell afterwards. Madir no longer recognized Naruto. All it wanted was blood and carnage. Wake the hell up, Madir. Naruto thrust his fist forward, his luminous eyes lit up. A burst of air struck the dragon, disorienting it. Run back to Visenya. You'll get in the way. Sarah's ashen face gaped in terror. What are you waiting for? Go now. Naruto barked before he raised his fist. As if on cue, a myriad of serpentine tree roots pierced out from the soil and enwrapped itself around the aggravated dragon effectively pinning it to the ground. Writhing and struggling, Madir attempted to escape but to no avail. Naruto patted Madir's snout, consoling him with soothing whispers. Shish, shish, it's all right, Madir, nobody is going to hurt you. Listen to my voice, it's me. Paralyzed in fear, 
Sira couldn't move an inch, but she was marveled by the fact that the dragon had ceased its aggression. Madir shut its eyes and whined softly to Naruto's touch. To tame a dragon like Madir, you need to beat him in combat. You are not ready yet. Naruto turned to Sira and offered her a reassuring smile. As of now, follow me. X. O. X. O. X. Sira chewed on her lips. The journey to wherever they were supposed to go was filled with a terrible silence. Was Naruto angry at her? Why didn't Visenya tag along with them? She was in distraught when she left, actually. How strange. On hindsight, Sira didn't know what compelled her to do what she did. Perhaps it was impulse, but it felt right. In her heart of hearts, she knew Madir was her destined partner. It would seem that you have taken a liking to Madir. Cheeks burning, Sira was embarrassed by what she did. I didn't know what force my hand. It's perfectly natural. Naruto smiled. You reacted strongly to him. That is a good thing. In time, you will be strong enough to subdue him. Until then, you have much work to do. Sira could perfectly visualize riding Madir across the horizon. It would be amazing to touch the imperial sky. A vast canvas of brilliant blue and white. High in the clouds. Soaked in the warmth of the afternoon sun. Watching flocks of birds migrating across continents, it would be a dream that she prayed never to wake up. Ever. The exhilaration of flying on a dragon's back invigorated her. I don't think I have told you this, but I am truly grateful to be part of something. Sira whispered with a heavy heart. I heard plenty of stories about you, you know, how the dragon warden founded Bravos, how the dragon warden restored old Valyria. They sound more like fantasy to me, until I met you. I guess all myths are foundation of reality. Naruto chuckled. You flattered me. I am only a glorified caretaker. Nothing more, nothing less. Why don't you tell me more about yourself? The only thing I know is that you were once a princess. Where should she start though? There was nothing grandiose about her story. Unlike Visenya, she wasn't a conqueror. Bards wouldn't sing about her. Hell, her name wouldn't be doented by the Targaryen ancestry. She was, nothing. My father used to walk me around his garden and tell me how much he wanted to change Flea Bottom for the better. That the people under his reign deserves better. The previous kings were too busy fighting for the throne that none of them saw a need to make the city a better place. I was a child back then, sheltered and naive. I didn't care about his ambitions, nor his people. Sira let out a hollow chuckle. All I cared about was which princes I wanted to marry. Life was ironic for Sira. It took loneliness for her to understand kinship and a deprivation of her royalty to appreciate her blessings. Fate worked in mysterious ways. As she found herself in a realm of mystery, she realized how ludicrously frivolous she used to be. Now, she saw the bigger picture. I sought not wealth nor marriage, but a purpose. I believe I have found mine. Believe it or not, being a dragon warden is not all it's cracked up to be. We have an important duty, not just to the dragons, but to the rest of creations. Can you imagine if the world could harness the power of the dragons? Naruto took Sarah's hand and led her across the log bridge. How tantalizing close he was, yet he was something of a puzzle to her. A puzzle that she really wanted to explore and solve. The Targaryen only has a handful of dragons and that was enough for them to conquer a continent. Have you considered using the dragons to help the world? A light-hearted laugh escaped his lips. Do you believe in the principle of causality? Sira arched a brow. Everything happens for a reason. My very strength invites challenge. Challenge brings about conflicts. Conflicts incites catastrophe. I have seen it, lived in it, and suffered from it. Mankind is not ready to know more about Dragon's Keep. Naruto sighed. The seed of evil has been planted in the heart of mankind long beyond Westeros was birthed. What they do will always be the same war, rape, destruction, just to name a few. The Targaryen brought peace to Westeros, Sira argued. How many wars were fought before the Targaryen united Westeros? How much blood was spilled for the sake of peace? Clicking his tongue, Naruto shook his head. While you hold a perspective of peace, those who suffered from the reign of the Targaryen only saw chaos. I will not take responsibility for the undoing of mankind. You believe that, I know that. Naruto's voice was deep, his features inscrutable. I was born in a world where men could do many great things and more. Things that are beyond your wildest imagination. Of course, nothing lives in perpetuity. 
Their extinction was inevitable. There was no savior to save them from their immolation. Mankind doesn't need a savior. We are our own salvation. Trust me when I say this, dragons and mankind must not coexist. I don't disagree. Naruto blinked. You don't. Vizania would have spilled out a list of flaws in my claims and then scold me for not giving a damn about humanity. Sarah shrugged. I am not Vizania. While she lived as a warrior with a genteel upbringing, I was a slave. I have seen what power can do to a person. What is so different about the slave masters and their slaves? Both breathe in the same air. Both require water and food to survive. The difference is, the despot has power and the rest has to suffer from it. I concur to your claims. Men should not have dragons. A wry grin curled at Naruto's lips, but he said nothing as they had arrived at their destination. A castle with scarred walls that were caked with mosses stood on a rugged slope. Perhaps it was once a fort that inspired awe, but now it was battered helplessly by countless storms. The decrepit tower looked as if it would crumble any moment. Broken gargoyles and dead trees flanked the cobblestone path that led to a colossal latticework door. A haunting wind swept past them, sending a blood-curdling chill crawling up Sarah's spine. This was the remnant of old Valyria. Once, it was a symbol of prosperity now a city of ruins. Where are we going? There is a catacomb that lies beneath this castle, that is where we are going. Catacomb? It will lead to Sword Grave. There is where we find you your weapon. Once you are well equipped, then you will be fit to swear your pledge. Sira stiffened. My pledge? To whom? You? No, Naruto blinked. To Ghidorah, the mother of dragons. As they entered the old castle, only the slumbering fire from the torches brought some semblance of tranquility for Sira in the abyssal darkness. That and the fact that she was walking closely behind the Almighty himself. As they descended the spiral of steps, Sira found herself eyeing Naruto's back with piqued interest. A destruction incarnate, yet humble to the bone and unfairly beautiful to boot. Everything seemed so surreal to Sira. Just a week ago, she was part of the Faceless Men, a stone-hearted assassin. Now, she was following the most powerful man. As they reached the bottom of the lair, Sira was taken aback by the mountains of gold, jewels and swords before her. Resting atop the treasure was a vast dragon of crimson scales. Welcome to Sword Grave. This place is guarded by Smaug. Naruto strolled casually to the dragon and petted its neck, who crooned at his delicate touch. All these swords that stood here are made from the finest metallurgy that this world has ever seen. The lords of Westeros and Essos would pay a fortune just to get one of these. All of them have a history to itself. War, carnage, destruction, they have seen it all. And you want me to pick up one of the swords lying around here? Naruto stared at Sira as if she had just sprouted a second head. No, silly. You don't just pick up a sword as you please. You have to find it through your will. My will? Sira raised a brow. Forgive me, but I don't quite get you. Sacrifice your blood on the pedestal before you. Swallowing hard, Sira bit her thumb and placed it on the bronze pedestal. Close your eyes. Naruto instructed. Though uneasy, Sira trusted him and did as she was told. You are born with a pool of arcane energy within you. Seek it. It's there. Don't resist it. Sarah's face contorted. I, I can't, yes, you can. Clear your thoughts. Don't be afraid. Sira could feel an unnatural warmth within her, its fury, like a tempest that had been injected into her veins. The surge of power was invigorating, almost intoxicating, and all the more dangerous. As her blood flowed through the cracks of the stone floor, tendrils of crimson light siphoned into one of the thousand swords. Screams of terror and anguish reverberated across the chamber, startling Sira. Amidst the demonic and distorted echoes, one name came to her. Brightroar she whispered softly. The sword was calling for her, its rage flowed inside her, she couldn't contain the cauldron of anger and power, but gnashed her teeth to withstand the burn. Wisps of luminescent smoke radiated from the sword, bright roar, compelling her to seize it. A few decades ago, a fool by the name of King Tom and Lannister brought a hundred ships to plunder the wealth and secrets of Dragon's Keep. I killed him, along with his men. Their souls were damned to wander in the seas mostly because they weren't willing to move on. Now, they reside within that accursed sword. If you claim Brightroar as yours, then its strength and terror are your responsibility. When Sira grabbed the hilt of Brightroar, 
Her body was afire with unholy energy. With bright roar in hand, she thrust it to the sky. White lightning blast out from the blade, burning and piercing everything around her. Her muscle was bursting with energy, her blood thundered in her ears. A terrible yet wonderful sensation at the same time. Was this what power felt like? Naruto narrowed his eyes and raised an open palm. The swords trembled, their sinister whispers flooded the air, but one blade flew to Naruto's grasp. This is Takami Kazuchi, a sword forged to slay gods. Naruto gave his blade, a gorgeous, intricate, and sinuous sword, a casual swing, unleashing an overwhelming pressure that sent hairline fractures to spread up the cavern walls like forked lightning. Heart racing, Sarah could taste the sweet nectar of evil emanating from Takami Kazuchi. It was safe to say that all of the swords buried in this tenebrous cave had seen their fair share of blood and gore before their solitude. Now, let us dance. Empowered, Sarah lunged at Naruto, her sword reared. Naruto parried the flurry of strikes that came his way, effortlessly evading every sweeping blows that were meant to behead him. Swiftly, Naruto spun towards Sarah, swinging his sword and colliding brutally against hers. The sheer force of the impact sent Sarah rocketing away. Is that all you got, my dear? Pain broke out across Sarah's shoulders. To think that Naruto was holding back his Herculean might almost made her nausea. Climbing to her feet, Sarah watched solemnly. Although her vision was swimming and blood was streaming from the side of her face, a realization struck her. A head-on combat, especially against someone of Naruto's caliber, was plain suicide. There must be other ways to beat him, and then she noticed how dark the cave was. A sly grin tugged at Sarah's pink lips before she infused her energy into her sword. A blinding white light flooded the cave before a fork of thunderbolt fired its way towards Naruto. As anticipated, the piercing light had blurred Naruto's vision. An opening. In his moment of distracted state, Sira exploited that window of opportunity and darted at him. Impressive. With his eyes closed, he dexterously caught Sarah's wrist, halting her momentum and her assault altogether. You presume that, without one of my senses being active, you will stand a chance. You have used your surroundings to your advantage. A tactician and a combat specialist, spectacular. Sira stumbled in shock. But how, my ears are as good as my eyesight, if not better. I can hear your footsteps and your heartbeat at the same time. Sarah's lips pursed for a moment, but then bloomed into a full smile. How did I fare? Beyond expectation. Though you are still not good enough to fight Madir, but with the proper training, you will be a force to be reckoned with. Red hot fire singed her cheeks. Now that her adrenaline ebbed away, she felt carnal desires sprung within her. The surge of energy that she had just experienced was taxing her body and she needed to do something to release her tension. Urgently, panting salaciously, Sira glanced up and saw his enigmatic and oblivious smile. His juicy, sculptured lips, that burning, determined eyes, and his alluring charisma were really making Sira hot and bothered. Oh, I recognized that look. Naruto quipped. Visenya was like this when she awakened her powers. I think you should. Unable to contain the dark desires coiled in her stomach, Sira jumped at Naruto. Her tongue found his. But only for a moment. With great will, Naruto pulled back, much to Sira's displeasure. Relentless, she snaked her hands around his neck and pulled him into a passionate, savage kiss. She needed to feel this magnificent, mind-numbing pleasure. That was all she could muster before darkness took over her. X. O. X. O. X. Sarah opened her eyes and gazed at an unfamiliar chandelier. The softness of the mattress, the lavender scent lingering in the air, and the music of crashing waves caught her attention. She jolted from her bed and glanced frantically around her. What in the seven hell happened? Her memory was fuzzy at best. In her peripheral, she noticed Brightroar leaning against the wall. All she could recall was her battle with Naruto and, cupping her mouth to stifle her gasp, Sira felt her legs weak and flustered. Her heart rate spiked. Did she try to you ally violate Naruto? Putting two and two together, Sira deduced that Naruto had not taken advantage of her inebriated state. Scrambling out of her bed, Sira sauntered to the window. Wow! The sunset! A blend of coral, blue, and fiery orange made a sight so astounding it almost took Sarah's breath away. From her balcony, she could see the vast ocean where the water was clear as crystal. Dragon's Keep was truly a paradise. 
When her eyes lingered down, she realized there was a hot spring right outside the house. That wasn't the only thing that got her attention. Someone was in it. A peculiar idea hit her. X. O. X. O. X. Visenya was disturbed. Ever since she returned to Dragon's Keep, she had been hearing voices. Treacherous and evil, the voices whispered the vilest things to her. Seduce Naruto, destroy Dragon's Keep, lead the Legion of Death, and bring fire and blood upon the world. Amongst the sinister echoes, one name stood out. Kagaya Otsutsuki. Where had she heard this name before? Soaking in the hot spring had calmed her nerves. Disciplined and sharp as she might be, she had fallen prey to the voices. If it wasn't for Naruto, Sira might already be dead. Her loyalty to the Dragon's Keep and her love for Naruto trumped everything else. No insidious voices were going to do her in, she wouldn't allow it. Deep in thoughts, Visenya didn't notice someone behind her. A pair of hands suddenly covered her eyes, startling her. Guess who? It took all of Visenya's self-control not to outright murder Sira out of impulse. Steadying her breaths, Visenya felt her eyelid twitched. I'm glad that you're awake, Sira. They say Targaryen princesses are immaculate and impossibly beautiful. With a razor sharp wit and a bouncy personality, Sira was a survivor and everything Visenya wasn't. Yin and yang. Oil and water, perhaps. Nevertheless, those were qualities that made a good dragon warden. When Visenya spun around, her personal space was violated crudely by a very naked Sira. You haven't given your maidenhead to Naruto, have you? W what in the world? H how did Sira know? That abrupt and inappropriate question caught Visenya off guard. Visenya felt her face flaming, unable to flounder for a response. An impish grin played about Sarah's lips as she realized Visenya was desperately trying to maintain a placid composure. You know, when I was in Volantis, I was very good at pleasuring women. So much so that almost all of my guests were wealthy widows from Pentos. Sarah traced Visenya's jawline with her finger. I know you love Naruto. And he loves you too. But he didn't want to consummate. Something is holding him back. Personal demons, I assume. Visenya let out a breath that she was holding and gritted her teeth. You should mind your own business. Oh, I am. I know he has left you, needy. As much as Visenya hated to admit it, her hormones were racing. How many nights had she fantasized for a night of passion with her beloved Naruto? Before Visenya knew it, Sira almost pounced at her. Things escalated too quickly. Sira grabbed Visenya's cascading golden hair and yanked down, bringing her face up, and her lips were on hers. Visenya tried to resist, but couldn't help but moan into their beseeching kiss, giving Sarah's tongue an opening. This was all it took for Sira to take full advantage. At first, Visenya showed some fight, trying to push Sira away, but when her tongue tentatively stroked hers, she melted and joined her in a slow, erotic dance. I can be your slave of passion. Sira gasped as she broke off their kiss, her voice husky. You don't need to commit to me. You don't need to love me. All I ask, is for you to let me help you. Part of Visenya wanted to run, but she found herself ensnared by Sarah's charm. It was true. Naruto left her wanting and hungry, but never satisfied. She wanted her first to be with Naruto, but he had proven to be evasive. Wanton desires had made Visenya's violet eyes into orbs of the brightest fire, something that had gotten Sarah's attention. Visenya's breathing went ragged when she felt Sarah's hand exploring her toned stomach and womanhood. Suddenly, Sira thrust her fingers inside Visenya, earning her a delicious and sensual cry. The proud and mighty Visenya Targaryen had soup bed to pleasure, her mouth tackled viciously by Sira. How unbecoming of you, that damnable voice again. It broke Visenya out of her stupor and gave her strength to push Sira away. Covering her mouth in anguish, Visenya stared wide eyes at Sira. T this is wrong. Wrong. From Sarah's world, only those with power were always right. Everything else was just a misconception, warped by morality and the lack of it. Licking her lips, Sarah clicked her tongue in disapproval. And what is right, just a second ago, you didn't hesitate to give in to me. I must leave. Hastily, Visenya climbed out of the hot spring, throwing a robe around her to cover her modesty before she jogged back to the mansion. X. O. X. O. X playing God required one to be acquainted with the devil. One could say Naruto was something of a god in Dragon's Keep and if he so desired he could very well be the god of the world. 
the truth was that hell was empty and all the devils roamed the world. That's what I tell myself when I see the suffering wrought upon men and did nothing. I don't interfere, because it is their choice. Who am I to take away their freedom? Naruto paced back and forth in a cave, where the wall arched a hundred feet up to giant stalactites and the rest was impenetrable darkness. The only ray of light permitted in the massive underground chamber was the gaping hole of the cave mouth. Do you know that there was a time when I truly empathize with you? I saw what you saw. I understood your worldview. You did what you thought was best for mankind. That was your narrative, Kagaya. Strapped to a cross was the haggard form of Kagaya Otsutsuki, the harbinger of the apocalypse and destroyer of worlds. Her baleful eyes, filled with utmost loathing for her nemesis, directed intensely at Naruto, who scoffed at himself. The people around me only saw the good deeds that I have stacked up, like an elegant wall that I built to hide the monster within me. Visenya thought she was a conqueror, but she has not seen half the things I have done. Twirling the dagger in his finger, Naruto stopped in his tracks. I am capable of many things. Even if that means getting rid of my memories. The happy ones. The sad ones. Do you know why I didn't do it? It was a rhetorical question. Kagaya wouldn't be able to verbally respond. The only thing she could manage was limited facial expression, courtesy of Naruto's seals. He grasped his chest, repressed sorrow surfacing on his face. This pain I felt. It is all I have left of Hinata. Naruto's eyes scanned his surroundings, as if reminiscing something distant. This was meant to be a tomb for the both of us. If we would to be awakened, then the fourteen flames, the mountains that I rose with my own bare hands, would consume what was left of us in a fiery hell. A worthy punishment for the sins we have committed. And yet, the many-faced god refused to claim us. Immortality is truly a curse, and a form of punishment for you. Amusement gleamed in Naruto's eyes as he grinned at Kaguya's sorry state. That only infused Kagaya with exasperation, yet she couldn't even shout out her protest. Pitiful, really. Oh, don't be angry. You have it coming. You took everything from me. I took your eternity from you. A fitting exchange, don't you agree? Stalking towards the cross, Naruto stashed his dagger away. I won't say I'm forgiving, but I forgive what I can. The genocide of my people turning half the world against me, using my friends, to get to me, but I will never forgive those who hurt my family. Tears rolled down Naruto's cheek as he glared with immense hate back at Kagaya. You killed Hanada, stole her face, and went, he croaked. You went to my children's bedroom, woke them up in their sleep, just so they could see the face of their mother murdering them. The trauma almost brought Naruto to his knees, but he stood firm, steady, unwavering, calm. Then I realized something. You claim to despise humanity, yet you behave just like them. You butcher and torment those who challenge your supremacy. Just like the humans. In essence, I didn't hate you for what you are. How could I? It would be hypocritical of me. After all, like you, I was born a monster. No, I hate you for what you choose to be. And what he could possibly become. Naruto turned to the exit. You kept me in my hell. I keep you in yours and I will continue to keep you incarcerated in this dark, vivid nightmare. In the end, you become nothing. Not even part of a history. Nobody will know who you are. Forgotten. Rotting in this, shithole. Kagaya couldn't squirm or even utter a groan. She was crucified to the cross, unmoving but furious. As Naruto stepped out of the cave, he gave one last look behind his shoulder. Instead of rage and despondence, Naruto saw a flicker of triumph in Kaguya's eyes. It was as if she had won. King Jaehaerys Targaryen, first of his name, King of the Andals, the Roiner and the First Men, Lord of the Seven Kingdoms, and Protector of the Realm, was tired beyond measures. Although he had done so much for his people, guilt and grief had wormed deep in his bones and blood. For the sake of peace, he had done what no parents should, to shape his most beloved daughter into a martyr. The Faith of the Seven, led by grey sunken cunts, schemed for an uprising, promising bloodshed if the Targaryens' incestuous practices weren't banished. The city would be sacked, temples razed, and senseless blood spilled. Sacrilege would be unfolded upon these sacred grounds, they chanted. It was Jaehaerys's duty as monarch to prevent calamity from happening, so he did what he had to do. However, words had gone by that her beloved daughter, Sira Targaryen, 
was very much alive and was roaming in the free cities. Septon Barth, the hand of the king and a faithful friend to Jaehaerys, was delighted when confided about the news. Diligently, Barth sent scouts throughout Essos to validate the credibility of the information. For once in a very long time, Jaehaerys felt joy. Butterflies were dancing in his stomach as he waited anxiously. Terror sloshed over Jaehaerys when the news came. Syrah was a slave in Volantis. Elisan Targaryen, the queen of the Seven Kingdoms, almost suffered a seizure when her husband broke it to her. The tale was so ugly and heart-wrenching that it felt like a fever breaking. If it wasn't for Barth's guidance, Jaehaerys would give in to his murderous impulse and burn Volantis down. Patience, Barth reminded him. In order to unravel Sarah's whereabouts, they needed time. Gold did wonders. It would be akin to finding a needle in a haystack if Elisan didn't hire hundreds of mercenary to find Sira. After months of fruitless investigation, they finally found something peculiar. The Tale of the Dragon Warden. According to Barth, Bravos worshipped the Dragon Warden and had even erected a colossal monument, the Titan of Bravos, to commemorate a folklore legend. Jaehaerys wasted no time to consult his library. For days, the king isolated himself amongst mountain of books, trying to find some clues regarding the Dragon Warden. Why did it sound so familiar to him? What was the connection between the Dragon Warden and Sira? At last, in the most unlikely content, he found something that caught his attention. In the lore recorded by his ancestor, King Aegon Targaryen, the Dragon Warden was a deity of old Valyria who took Visenya Targaryen as his servant and bride. Upon first glance, it sounded more of a fairy tale than reality, conjured by a madman. As preposterous as it was conceived, all fictions which like all great stories were rooted in truth. What if the Dragon Warden did exist? You have sequestered yourself in here for weeks, your grace. Barth plopped down on the oaken chair, surveying the rows of ornate bookcases that shelved thousands of books. Some of the collections were covered in dust. Why don't we go out for a walk, E.H.? I can grab me a few lads with us for some hunting. Jaehaerys pinched the bridge of his nose, as if nursing his headache. What is your thoughts about the Dragon Warden, old friend? A story we tell our kids at night, the hand replied matter-of-factly. All the scouts that were sent to Essos came back with similar messages, and they all mention about the Dragon Warden. If we dwell long enough in this, I know we can find ourselves a breakthrough. I just need time. If I may, some of the scouts claim that the Dragon Warden is a man who can take the form of a dragon. The Bravo Sea even built shrines to worship him. Now, tell me, how outrageous do you think that sounds? Barth's jest had left something to be desired for Jaehaerys was glowering at him. What, I'm trying to be rational here, are you trying to assert that, magic of that caliber exist? Before the Targaryen united the Seven Kingdoms, dragons were considered as myths too. The king sighed, perhaps we are not seeing what is before us. And what is before us? I know this may sound, crude, but as a friend, I believe I have to say this. Barth clenched his fist. Whatever you wanted to say, it wasn't going to be pretty. There is also the possibility that Sira is dead. Jaehaerys stiffened. How dare you? Listen to me, Jaehaerys. Sira fled the faith for more than a decade ago. Nobody knows if the rumors are real or not. Besides, you can't possibly believe some story that Aegon fabricated to cover the fact that he killed his own sister. No, Jaehaerys averted his gaze. Aegon Targaryen will never kill Visenya Targaryen. That's ludicrous. Is it? Barth shook his head and leaned into his seat. Old Valyria is now a wasteland. Inhabitable. Any sailors worth their salt would tell you that. You expect me to believe a man who can take the form of a dragon kidnapped a princess from the Targaryen dynasty and was allowed to live? Are you not familiar with your ancestry? When Rhaenys Targaryen was murdered by the Dornish, Aegon set everything that belongs to the Dornay ablaze. He retaliated with fire and blood for Rhaenys, so why didn't he do the same for Visenya? Does it even make any sense to you? Maybe, the Dragon Warden proved to be a formidable foe. Jaehaerys countered, uncertainty laced in his voice. A conqueror Aegon might be, but he wasn't impulsive in his battles. Maybe Aegon didn't want to anger the Dragon Warden? Barth heaved out a heavy sigh. I know the loss of your daughter has devastated you. I wouldn't go as far to say that I know what it feels like, because I don't, and I wouldn't even wish that upon my worst enemy. Jaehaerys, please, 
This thing is killing you. It's killing your wife too. I don't want to see my friends suffer in anguish. This is pointless. Pointless? Rage passed over Jaharis's wrinkled face like a comet. Catching his breaths, he slammed his book shut. What if Sira is truly alive? What if she is out there? Barth, my child needs me. Then answer me this. Barth narrowed his eyes, the cloying sweetness in his voice was gone. Each word articulated became heavy, draining Jaharis's blood at every blow. Assuming she is alive. Assuming we found her. Do you think she will forgive you? For what you did? The king's eyes widened like saucer. His mouth parted, floundering for words yet none escape his dried lips. I. Have you seen bloodhounds before, your grace? Jaharis scowled, but said nothing. He felt numb, barren like winter and kept his gaze at the parchment on the table. They make great pets. My brother used to have one. Oliver, he named it. Oliver was always envious about the freedom wild rabbits have. One day, my brother brought the bloodhound for hunting. Oliver was always excited about hunting, but my brother never allowed it to do so. Said he didn't want Oliver to be ferocious, but is it not the dog's nature to hunt? At that, Barth scoffed. But one day, my brother wanted to test a theory, so he took off his dog's leash. In that instant, Oliver spotted a wild rabbit. Never saw something as beautiful as that dog running. Chasing after its dream, I suppose. Until it finally caught it. But to the horror of my brother, Oliver killed the rabbit. Tore it into pieces. That dog spent its whole life trying to catch that thing. Now it had no idea what to do. X. O. X. O. X. Everything that had happened in Dragon's Keep was akin to a fantasy for Sira Targaryen. Every waking moment was an adventure, as she was always learning something new and thrilling. Dragons were not just beasts. Empathy, intelligence, wit. They were capable of so much more, yet their loyalty to Naruto was insurmountable. In this realm of vast splendor, Naruto was a god, revered and feared. Perhaps, in retrospect, Sira found solace living with a deity. As the breeze swept past, a smile crept across her face. In her voyage of self-discovery, she had come to realize that being a dragon warden didn't disclose her identity to herself. Sira already knew what she was. In Dragon's Keep, she caught a glimpse of what she could be. Often, Sira found herself wandering the deserted shore and sat on the rocks, the sea sprayed at her feet and her eyes fixed on the horizon. It was her sanctuary, a place where she could let the ocean wash away her thoughts. When Naruto perched beside her, Sira wasn't startled. After all, the whole of Dragon's Keep belonged to him. I see you have taken a liking to the view. Quite amazing, isn't it? My father used to tell me to be satisfied with my lot in life, that the world owes me nothing. Sira turned to him. Naruto's lambent eyes were bright as fire and his hair was like the sun in the water. I wasn't satisfied, obviously. So I left. Tried to fight my destiny, a foolhardy attempt. Almost died doing so, but I think I am content now. Naruto chuckled. Do you know that natural selection brings about sentient life in this world using only one methodology? Failure. Our blunders either bring us closer to our destiny or lead us spiral down to the abyss. You have encountered many obstacles in your path. I am glad that you have found your place amongst the dragons and cattle. Abruptly, Naruto cupped Sarah's chin delicately with his finger and thumb, but never be content with what you are. You are starting to discover the mystery about this world. Character is not built through a time of content and peace. It is forged from the fire of perils and hardship. Content brings only stagnation. Stagnation is the bane of all existence. It was moments like this that Sira could hear her pulse, loud in her ears. Hot desires was raging inside her stomach. A broken woman, defiled and abused, should be undeserving of a god's love, but she could dream. Deep down, Sira knew she had no right to claim him. But fate had intertwined their fates. Rare moments such as these where another soul dipped near hers, as stars once a year brushed the earth, were hard to come by. Such a constellation was he to her. As the breeze swept past, trickling over her skin, she ran her fingers over his hand that was caressing her warm cheek. I always wonder about something. Naruto arched a brow. Ask away. You are compassionate to the lives in Dragon's Keep, yet indifferent to those outside this realm. The contrast doesn't quite fit the character. If I weep every time a mortal dies, I'll drown in a week. 
Amusement gleamed in his storm-lit eyes. No matter how vivid men live their lives, no matter the wonders they make, no matter the horrors they wrought, in the end, they all come to dust and smoke. Meanwhile, I outlive them. This generation. The next. Another hundred years. It meant nothing to me, like a heartbeat. Am I a mere heartbeat to you? Naruto said nothing, but brushed a lock of hair behind her ear. Sometimes, Siro would catch him watching her. An intentness would come over his face before he began asking sideway questions. It was only principle that she answered in riddles, enticing his frustration and intrigue. A door that did not open at its knock was a novelty in its own right. She had seen the ragged scars on his bare, muscular back when he was chopping down trees like a relentless lumberjack. Unfair as it might be, Sira always probes about his scars. Each had a story of its own and he would tell her by daylight. Often, he would share his heroic stories under the shade of an apple tree, where the grass was sun warm and the scent wafted over him as he napped. She would lay beside him and watch as he slumbered, heavy with murmurs and tremors on his face. Her heart pang for him, for he went to war every time he closed his eyes. If it wasn't for his tendency to disappear for a couple of months unannounced, Sarah was certain she would have made Naruto hers. Apparently, Naruto dwelled within region of Dragon's Keep that was forbidden even to Vizanya, as the behemoths residing there were as old as the dawn of Valyria and they had no love for mankind whatsoever. I believe Vizanya is waiting for your duel. Let us not keep her waiting, shall we? Sira nodded and followed Naruto to the hills. X. O. X. O. X. You are late. Basenya's voice was like shearing metal as her gaze pierced Sira. I hope you're not idling somewhere again. The Targaryen envisioned Visenya as a blade hung to a hair's fineness, so delicate that one would not even know if one had been cut. She was burning certainty, and before her all the stained dross of the world must shrink away. Armed and armored, Visenya was a goddess of war, always ready for battle. Sira did a mock bow. My apologies. Seeing that there was nobody to guard our shorelines, hence I offered my humblest contribution. Unsheathing Dark Sister from her waist, Basenya took a stance, a grin oozing confidence played about her lips. No excuses. Your tardiness warrants punishment. Valerie and Steel were spell forged, which explained their impeccable durability. With the doom of Valyria, the secret of such arcane metallurgy was lost. It was said that Valerie and Steel was more valuable than gold itself not because of its finiteness or delicate craftsmanship, but its latent ability to channel magic. Harnessing magic required arduous training and years of study. No one without proper guidance should ever dabble with the incarnation of chaos. The fundamental planes from which a caster could draw magic were from the elements, earth, water, air, fire, and lightning. Naruto wielded magic like an art, transcending the very fabric of reality by creating things of awe and beauty. In the hands of the wicked, however, it became a primal force that could doom the world. Punishment? Sira let out a dramatic gasp. She was a gifted actress, it would seem. Oh my. Why don't we stop fighting each other and make the most of the time we have? Together. Maybe we can even invite Naruto to join in. Shameless, as usual. That's not what you said to me last night. A pink flush flamed Visenya's cheeks. W we will not talk about that here. Ready your sword. Sira brandished Brightroar. What are you talking about? I'm born ready. No, you're not. Naruto decided to make himself known as he emerged from the woods, a half bitten apple in his hand. Today, the two of you will have a spar against me. As Visenya brushed her fingers up, Dark Sister, the runes engraved on the sword glowed an ominous blue. White mist, cold as the bleakest night of winter, hissed from Dark Sister. Fingers of frost spread like a plague, covering the great oaks and forest bed around Visenya. What's the wager? I will grant the winner a wish, so long as it is within my reach and capability. With that, Visenya and Sarah's eyes lit up. A wish, they said in unison. Naruto nodded and dug out a bell from his pocket. The rule is simple, you have by sunset to snatch this bell from me. There is only one bell though, Sarah pointed out. Precisely. Naruto grinned. If you fail, however, you will be polishing every sword there is in Sword Grave. Sounds like there is no room for failure. Rest assured, I don't need till sunset to grab that bell. Visenya gave her sword a practice swing. Don't get in my way, Sarah. I was about to say the same thing to you too. 
Abruptly, but not unexpectedly, Sarah lunged at Naruto, her sword reared. Element of surprise didn't work on Naruto, because when his adrenaline kicked in, everything around him slowed down. Taking a step back, Naruto effortlessly evaded Sarah's assault. Big mistake. Livid black clouds blotted out the sun, churning and swirling like a vortex above its target. Blue lightning radiated from Sarah's voluptuous frame, allowing the transcendental energy within her to course through her veins. Sarah offered Naruto a triumphant grin and a cheeky wink. Blinding white light engulfed the earth before the heavens threw down spears of thunderbolt at Naruto. Reacting to impulse, Naruto instinctively cartwheeled his way out of danger, but fell to the next pitfall. His feet were frozen solid. Their teamwork was impeccable, Naruto reflected. A barrage of blades, conjured up from ice, rained down upon Naruto. It was not something he didn't foresee. Colossal roots burst forth from the sodden ground, forming an arc to shield Naruto from the shower of death. Is that all you got? Not yet. Adrenaline flowed through Vizanya's every being as she raised her hands and called forth a blizzard. Sheltered under the safety of the trees, Naruto didn't really see what Vizanya was scheming, but the sudden silence, deafening and freezing, prickled his skin. Sensing danger, Naruto stepped out of his cover, sucked down a mouthful of frigid air, and glanced up. An iceberg the size of an asteroid was descending upon him. I just have to ask, huh? Naruto clicked his tongue, but smiled nonetheless. Vizanya had come a long way. It would be an insult to her endeavor if he went easy on her. Golden radiance, bright like the sun, illuminated from Naruto's body, swathing him like a gallant knight's armor. He cocked his fist, crimson effulgence lit up from his slit-like eyes. Scorching steam hissed to life, escaping from the edge of Naruto's lips as he delivered a punch at the sky. A blast of shockwave, so absolute and earth-shattering, erupted, pulverizing the gargantuan ice into smithereens. The dark clouds that blanketed dragons keep were blown away by the ungodly force in a blink of an eye. Warmth and sunshine had returned to the grassland. Vizanya and Sarah stood their ground, but fear and awe were thundering in their veins. You won't get anywhere if you don't go all out. Naruto smiled. While we're at it, why don't we commence your trial of the dragon, Basenya? The trial of the dragon, a pilgrimage for sorcery supreme. Basenya had been overzealous in her training just so she could be worthy. It was said that the Targaryen were blessed with the fortitude to tame nature's greatest weapons, dragons. She was born to this. In order to grasp the primordial magic of the dragons, one must pass the trial of the dragon or lost their mind to terror. With pleasure, black wisp of smoke rose from Vizanya's skin and her body lit up in flames. Sarah took a retreating step, this wasn't her fight anymore. From the cocoon of fire and darkness, a serpent rose. With scales that were white as snow and wings so vast it could swallow up a village with its mere shadows, Vizanya had become a dragon, towering over the trees around her. As she drew to her full height, her eyes, two pools of molten gold, snapped open. Though dragons were fire made flesh, she brought the howls of icy winds upon the world. When she dropped her jaws, a deafening roar shook the forest to its core. Naruto couldn't help but smile in pride. The conceited conqueror died the day she trespassed Dragon's Keep, and was reborn in blood and fire. This was but the tip of the iceberg, for the trial of the dragon required one to overcome impossible odds. The instinct to unleash mindless destruction would overwhelm Vizanya, rendering her deranged with insatiable bloodlust if she couldn't tame the beast within her. Worst case scenario, Vizanya sickbed to her thirst for carnage and needed to be put down for good. Naruto would not let it happen, not on his watch. Come at me with all you got, my dear. Naruto gave his knuckles a good cracking. I know I won't hold back. Sira could have sworn the great dragon before her was grinning. No tongue of flames belched from Vizanya's maw. Instead, her breath unleashed an unforgiving wave of pristine snow and screaming silver that threatened to bury the earth in an avalanche of her rage. Naruto leapt into the air, Takamikazuchi materialized into his grip. With one swing from his sword, he fired a fork of lightning. Wind and thunder clashed, surged, and spiraled into a mad twister. The white dragon lunged at Naruto. Her obsidian teeth were curved like blades and could lacerate a horse with ease. When steel met scales, Naruto was surprised that Basenya's hide was impervious to weapon forged from magic. Not even the mighty Alduin could take blows from Takamikazuki without being scarred. 
With that, Naruto infused his muscles with an abundance of energy, empowering his muscles and bones in the process. In split seconds, he was gone. Nowhere to be seen. Vizanya stayed vigilant, scanning her environment frantically and sniffing out for any disturbance in the atmosphere. By the time she registered his presence, he had already sunk a fist right into her jaw, discombobulating her. Ears ringing and visions jarred, Vizanya shook her head, swinging her claws haphazardly. Bestowed with great powers to reduce army into ashes and raise kingdoms, Visenya had forgotten humility. She had become reckless, because she believed she was invulnerable. She had grown dauntless, for the might of a dragon was unchallenged. Oh, how wrong she was. Always be wary and decisive in battle, Naruto had reminded her incessantly. If the seas had become calm, it was because a storm was coming. Regaining her composure, Visenya smashed her tail right into Naruto's sternum, knocking the wind out of him. Much to her chagrin, Naruto's form exploded into puff of smokes. A decoy. Visenya searched the field warily. Where was he? Had she been fighting Naruto's doppelganger all this time? Damn it. Closing her eyes, she enlarged her senses. She could feel everything around her. The squirrels dashing up a trunk, the sweet tang of huckleberries lingering in the air, the birds pecking insects out of the muck, fluttering leaves from the high boughs, and a familiar heartbeat. There, when Visenya snapped her attention to the sky, she saw horror. Naruto stood in the air with his hands raised, a brilliant white shaft cast upon him. The Rasengan. Beautiful it might seem, yet its purpose was to drill flesh and mince bones. Visenya had seen Naruto blew off chunks of mountains with that luminescent sphere. A dragon's scale might be impenetrable to a certain extent, but it would not make her invincible. She would still be susceptible to overwhelming attack. Regression. It is what defines a hero. Naruto narrowed his eyes. A hero overcome the odds. It could be a loss of a loved one, the uncovering of a truth, or realizing a dream that reveals to be a nightmare. It becomes fears and insecurities that hold them back, make them see the worst in everything. The allure of despair sometimes become too strong and we lost ourselves in it. And when we give in to our fears, we lose. The trial of the dragon is not just about controlling the form that you hold. It serves as a reminder that you should never lose yourself in your fear. You have been in the shadows of your own doubts, Visenya. Naruto turned his attention to Sarah, who was peering at the battle from behind a tree. Without hesitation, he fired a sphere of blinding white light at Sarah's direction. Now let us see what you choose to be. X. O. X. O. X. Ya. White. Everything was white. Sen. Blood rushing, the heart's staccato lullaby, and a rich symphony of ocean's waves enfolded Visenya. Vison. Who's calling her? That voice. So, familiar. Visenya. Visenya's eyes fluttered open and she was thrust back into reality. She found herself resting on Sarah's lap. W what happened? You saved me. Sira looked at her in disbelief. Nursing her throbbing forehead, Visenya sat up. That feeling of being all-powerful was suddenly gone. Back to a mortal again, Visenya mused. You have forsaken yourself for others. Naruto's voice boomed like a rumbling thunder. He was backlit, a little more than a silhouette because of the bright sun shining behind him as he levitated above Dragon's Keep. Awe-inspiring and Herculean. The people of Westeros would have abandoned their faith if they had seen Naruto in all of his glory. Transcending beyond the nature of a dragon. You have passed the trial of the dragon, but. Suddenly, Visenya and Sira were surrounded by hundreds of masked assassins, each and every one was armed to the teeth. You have not completed your task yet. Dangling the bell between his fingers, Naruto grinned. A dragon warden is not just the protector of the realm, but a force of nature too. Now it is time for you to show me your limits. There was no room for ambivalence. Sarah knew her limits well, but if she wanted to conquer her fear of being helpless, then there was no time for sulking. It was either fleeing or facing adversity head on. Catching a glimpse of Visenya, Sarah felt inspired. Courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. Sarah could tell Visenya was fearful, if her trembling fingers were any indication. Never retreat, never surrender. We'll fight with all our might. Together, Sira. Sira nodded, their swords manifested from snow and lightning. Empowered with magic, they were light as feathers, strong as a bull, 
and heaps faster than a cheetah. With a burst of speed, Visenya and Sira vanished. Slicing and slashing, they butchered their way to Naruto, racking up body count at an incredible pace. With a dodge to the left, Visenya bifurcated her foe in half, blood splashed across her cheeks. With a jerk to the right, Sira plunged her sword into her foe's stomach. Kill one, and two more bastards sprouted from mud and sand. This was getting nowhere. Sira, Visenya cut down an assassin and barked. I'll create an opening. Go take that bell. Got it. Clenching her jaw, Visenya leapt into the air, infusing tremendous energy into her fists, and dove back down to earth like a meteor. Geysers of ice shot up, eradicating the horde in a fraction of a second. Now. Sira pounced at Naruto, steel clashed against steel, it was then Takamikazuki lit up in flames. Sira had heard legends about that fabled sword. One stroke from Takamikazuki and even dragons would die. Futile. Abruptly, Naruto took a step back, sheathed his sword, and drew it out with inhumane speed. It was as if the wind was sharpened like a blade, dissecting trees and boulders as it swept across the forest. Much to his surprise, Sira had parried the strike with precision and retaliated fluidly with a swing of bright roar. It wasn't meant to decapitate him, but his realization was a second too late. The bell fell into Sarah's hand. X. O. X. O. X. Slaver's Bay prospered when the mighty Valyrian freehold melted into oblivion. Its rulers were cruel despots and narcissistic crones who saw themselves as gods, taking the glory of the old empire of Gascari with twisted pleasure. Slavery was a currency in a hell where men were sold as eunuchs for war and women were forced into a life of prostitution. After all, power corrupts, but absolute power corrupts absolutely. Atop the Great Pyramid of Marine, the aristocrats of Slaver's Bay sat on their thrones, sipping apricot wines while the Harpies' Jubilee rang high. It was an annual celebration where the tyrants of Slaver's Bay gathered in Marine to celebrate the fall of Old Valyria and the rise of the Great Masters of Marine, the Wise Masters of Yunkai, and the Good Masters of Astapur. Feasts would be thrown, decadence to be indulged, and the fighting pits would be uproarious. Kornik Zo Paul of Marine, a cantankerous lecher with a fetish for small boys, weighed his fellow masters carefully with his droopy eyes. He never went anywhere without his boy slaves leashed to himself. I propose this meet to discuss about something important. A matter that might determine our rule in Essos. Fravni's Mo Naklaws of Astapur snorted, knowing what was to come. Although he had an odious face and was severely obese, he was shrewd as a serpent for he pioneered the infamous Unsullied. I will wager a guess and say you intend to raid the ruins of Valyria. Tokaz Zo Yunzik of Yunkai rolled his eyes, he was a bald man, a zealot, and a neurotic curmudgeon. If he had a toothache, he would burn his slaves on the stake as sacrifices for his gods. If the weather wasn't to his liking, he would drown his slaves for his gods. The fourteen flames have consumed the damned Valyrians. What can you possibly find there beside bones and ashes? There are things out there more valuable than gold and silver. Kornik grinned. I am talking about dragons. Fravnes and Tokaz raised their brows, exchanged glances, and broke into mocking guffaws. Dragons? Fravnes held his massive belly. Have you gone mad, Kornik? The dragons that once flew in Essos are long gone. Need I remind you that the Targaryens are thriving in Westeros with their dragons as we speak? Kornik spat. Three dragons. That was all it took for Aegon Targaryen to bring Westeros to its knees. The disturbing fact sent a chill crawling up their spines. The old empire of Gascari had the unbeatable lockstep legions, whose very presence in the battlefield could break the spirit of any adversary. That was how wars were won. Shock and awe. But what if there was an unstoppable force that could not be shocked and awed? What if there were monstrosities that could vaporize army into cinders and melt fortresses down? That was how the Valyrian dominated Essos. With dragons. On hindsight, the whole of Essos didn't bow down to Valyria because of its dragons. They bowed down out of fear. Fear made men timid. The masters of Slayer's Bay took that lesson to heart and ingrained fear into their slaves, because fear was primal. Once men became timid, they would prefer the calm of despotism over the tempestuous sea of liberty. Now imagine, a hundred of dragons, under our reign, Kornik said with his hands opened wide, allowing Fravnes and Tokaz to balk at the idea. A hundred dragons? The whole of Essos? 
nay, the world would be at their mercy. Still, it was just a pipe dream, no matter how grandiose it was weaved. Fravnes took a long hard glare at Kornick and responded with a gruff and candid tone. And how, pray tell, are we going to get ourselves the dragons that you speak of? Are you proposing that we send our fleets into Westeros and fight the Targaryens on uncharted territory? That will be madness of the highest order. Words have it that the dragons from old Valyria have not gone extinct yet. They are very much alive. If we send our slaves to plunder the richest and secrets of old Valyria, we might stumble across dragons' eggs. Ignorance was the reason behind the fall of the old empire. Lies, misinformation, disinformation. Tokaz wasn't going to repeat his ancestors' mistakes and his wrinkled face was visibly hardened, a quirk that made the slaves tied to his throne gulped almost imperceptibly. You spoke of such tall tales with a careless deposition and expect us to send our slaves to do your bidding? Although the voyage to the ruins of Valyria would be harsh, the masters of slavery's bay weren't bothered in the slightest. Their slaves would sail across the smoking sea. If they perished in the treacherous storms, the masters needed only to send more and they had an abundance of slaves at their disposal. But would it even be a worthwhile investment? Fravenus's lips thinned. I believe Tokaz has made a point. My unsullied are not trained to be sailors, but foot soldiers. It would be unwise for us to raid a place that is notorious for being impregnable. I am going to cross the smoking seas with or without the both of you. Kornick's expression darkened. But if my sources are right, and if my slaves found what I'm looking for, then you of all people should know that no amount of bootlicking is going to stop me from destroying Astapor and Yunkai. Fravnes and Tokaz shifted uncomfortably in their seats. Out of fear, they conceded. X. O. X. O. X. Stars decorated the black satin with its glowing specks, illuminating dragons keep even in its coldest night. Lavender curtains billowed in the evening breeze and the fragrance of honeysuckle drifted into the bedroom. Naruto had carried an unconscious Vizanya in his arms and tucked her into her bed. Dragon transformation magic had put a toll on her. After all, she was only human. Taking one last glance at Visenya's slumbering form, Naruto gently closed the door and made his way to the courtyard, which was an outdoor gallery for exotic flowers and sculptures. Sira sat by the pond with a goblet of rice wine between her fingers, stargazing in peaceful silence. Who would have thought wine could be fermented from rice and still taste like sweet opulence? Any thoughts about your wish? Naruto plopped down beside Sira. Their night was serenaded by the sparrows chirping atop the trees. I thought about it. Sira brushed a lock of hair behind her ear. There is something I always want to do. I'm listening. A closure. Sira watched his ocean blue eyes flickered. Then she said, I want to know why my father abandoned me. Why did he sell me off when he claimed to love me the most? There were so many questions I wanted to ask him. He thought about what she had said and felt her hand lingering on his, her thumb tracing slow circles. The truth, often than not, does not set you free. It might hurt you, make you lament. Are you ready for it? It was a while before she answered, her voice hesitant. I don't know, Naruto. Are you afraid of the truth? Naruto nodded without speaking, and she smiled at his honesty. Is this regarding your late wife? You rarely spoke about her. I guess I want to forget about everything. Throw myself into work and taking care of the dragons. I didn't dare to love Visenya. Or you. Naruto heaved out a sigh and took Sarah's hand, surprising her. But I'm tired of being afraid. Tired of running away from the truth. Tired of pointing fingers and blaming my insecurities on others. And the truth is, I need to move on. Who would have thought that the mighty and powerful Naruto, a god amongst men, felt vulnerable and helpless. Sira squeezed his hand, cradled it, and rested her head on his shoulder. He could smell her, soft like lilac. Do you regret allowing Visenya and me to be here in Dragon's Keep? The both of you are the best thing that's ever happened to me. There is not one day I don't feel blessed to have the both of you here. We might have our ups and downs. More so with Visenya. Naruto chuckled, but it makes me feel alive. His confession made Sarah's heart beat even faster, it was then she noticed his shirt was loose and she could appraise him so clearly. He was made of marble, chiseled to perfection and a living aspiration of what men should emulate. His sunblow hair slicked to the back and his strong jaw oozed strength. She felt her heart thundered in her chest and fire heating her cheeks. She lifted her head from his shoulder and looked directly at him, why did you try to kill me just now? 
Naruto arched a brow. I don't follow. Our spars. You fired a Rasengan at me. If Basenya were to lose herself in her dragon transformation magic, she might not come and save me. A frown marred her beautiful features, but it barely hid the hurt in her eyes. At that, Naruto shook his head. When you morph into a dragon, you become biologically and physiologically a dragon. Your instincts. Your senses. The compulsion to kill. They become sharpened and heightened to extraordinary levels. But your consciousness will fade away over time. The only way for Visenya to pass the trial is to evoke a powerful emotion in her, and I know she cares deeply for you. You used me as bait. Her eyes were downcast. You made a gamble. A gamble that might cost me my life. You're wrong. His voice softened. I would never put your life at risk. If Visenya didn't react to my provocation, I was ready to step in for you. You were hiding behind the trees, no? Those trees were ready to protect you if Visenya didn't do what she did. She loves you more than you know, Sira. Sira pursed her lips in silence, collecting her thoughts. I shared my bed with her, do you know that? Yes, I do. I always envision my relationship with Visenya as a thread tugging at my heart. She glanced down. She was everything I wanted to be. A warrior of impeccable beauty and grace. At first, I was poking fun with her. I just want to see her break character. But the more I did those things, the more I realized the truth. I knew I could no longer lie beside her without wanting to touch her. I couldn't feel her breath upon my mouth, without wanting to kiss her. Sira was afraid to look Naruto in his eyes. She was fearful of seeing the look of betrayal and rage, but her curiosity got the best of her. Peering up, she was surprised to see his smile. There was something about his smile that sent butterflies in her stomach. When his face lit up, the radiance he exuded made anybody who had the fortune to see it feel the irresistible urge to smile too. I am glad that you were there for Visenya. I knew about her feelings for me, but I wasn't ready to act on it. I didn't want to lose the people I loved, so I closed myself up, it was cowardly of me. I think I am in love with you, Naruto. Sira blurted out, only to realize what she had said after a few seconds later. It was already too late to take it all back, but she didn't regret it. Do you love me? Naruto averted his gaze, as if lost in his own thoughts. Do you want to go to Westeros, to visit your father? Do you love me? Her tone was firm. She wasn't backing down from her confession. His silence had drove a dagger into her heart. Humiliating, she thought. To think that she was dismissed so coldly. As she was about to get away from him, he reached out for her wrist and offered her a weak smile. Her body began to tremble with anticipation. Are you willing to be the anchor of my life? The happiness for my soul? Sira straddled his hips and leaned into him, feeling the heat between them and his arm tight around her waist. Everything suddenly felt right. The rice wine, the chirping sparrows, her confession. It couldn't have been more perfect. Like magic, their past didn't matter anymore. She looked at her with hazy, wanting eyes, and he kissed her softly on her lips. She brought her hands to his face and touched his cheek brushing it softly with her fingers. He leaned in slowly and kissed her once more. She closed her eyes and lose herself in euphoria and ecstasy. This was what heaven felt like. She took his hand and led it to her, and a whimper rose in her throat as his fingers slid through her black negligee. The world faded away from them and they were locked in their moment of pleasure and passion. As she pulled back from him, she saw his face aglow. Wordlessly, she undid the buttons on his shirt. He watched her as she did it and listened to her soft breaths as she made her way downward. With each button loosened, he felt her fingers brushing against his skin. I'm a monster, Sira. Is this what you want? I know of no one who is as human as you are. Sira smiled, her eyes gleaming with mischief. You still haven't answered my question. Fear flashed across Naruto's eyes, but it was gone instantly. I do. I love you, Sira. She crashed her lips into his, moaning fervently. Unbeknownst to them, Visenya stood on her balcony, watching everything unfolding before her. Frost grew at the edge of the windows, like a creeping mold as her rage went wild. She betrayed you. Sira was snoring softly into the crook of Naruto's neck. His powerful arms wrapped around her creamy shoulders as he felt the heat between them, their naked bodies intertwined under the sheet. As the sunlight poured in, Sarah's flawless skin almost glowed. A fine masterpiece that was given life, Naruto mused. She was akin to a song, a dream, 
or a whisper and he didn't know how he could have lived in solitude for so long without her. The night they had shared together was like a fairy tale to him. Her mouths crafted a warm path to his, their tongues dancing to a rhythm, her hand slid up his neck as her nails grazed his skin, finding purchase in his hair, and tugging at the tangle. Shivers lanced his body, a sensation he had forgotten. Gone was the guilt that kept him from betraying his late wife with Sira. He was a man, and she was the woman he wanted. Not so long ago, he was adrift, fearful of loving, and languished in the darkness. But now he saw a glimpse of light. Some semblance of hope to let him live for more. And he would be damned if he let that light be snuffed out by his own misgivings. Entangling himself from Sarah's grasp, Naruto managed to free himself. As much as he wanted to lie in bed and marvel at Sarah's beauty, there were things for him to attend to. Delivering a soft peck on her lips and brushing a few strands of her hair over her ear, Naruto climbed out of bed, picked up his clothes from the marble floor, and gave his sore arm a good stretch. So this was how home felt like. Raking a hand through his coiffed back hair, Naruto sauntered out of his chamber. A brilliant flash from a streak of lightning flickered across black clouds and the deafening booms thundered across Dragon's Keep, startling Naruto. Then came the lashing rains that hounded his mansion. For a moment, Naruto swore he saw the world was dyed blood red. As he stepped into the hallway, a wind swept past him and a foreboding feeling almost made his stomach lurched. With his senses heightened, he picked up a stench of juniper and wet moss lingering in the air. After all these years, he would never forget this scent of evil that had once polluted his old home and filled him with dread. The scent of Kagaya was leaking from Visenya's room. No, 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 horror struck. Naruto's heart thundered in his chest as he rushed into Visenya's chamber. When he kicked open the door, a gush of bitter gale swallowed him and his nightmare come true. Visenya sat on her bed, still and motionless. White frost had painted all over the walls and her dead eyes were fixated at the window. In his peripheral, Naruto espied the mirror and gasped. In place of the beautiful visage of Visenya gleaming in the mirror, Naruto saw Kagaya and her cruel grin taunting him. His eyes widened in terror as realization dawned on him. Why did you betray me, master? The platinum gold of her hair had faded to white, her skin pallid pale, and her violet eyes illuminated a dangerous glow. This was no mere possession. The steel of Visenya's voice had turned into faux sweetness, resembling that of Kaguya's. I don't sleep very well, er at all. The haunting image of Kagaya started to cackle in the mirror, but her distorted voice didn't go unheard. I spend my days in the darkness, imagining ways of tormenting you. How to destroy Naruto Uzumaki, the man who took everything from me. I thought of corrupting your beloved dragons. Make them deranged. It would be poetic, I supposed, but unrefined. Too churlish. And then I found Visenya. Naruto almost cursed out loud. The air around Visenya had warped into something foul and the biting cold cut through his skin. Kaguya's sinister echoed rang in his ears. You locked me up like I am an animal. But I will never return to that hole again. I shall be reborn once more. And this time, the world will burn as I rise. But before that, I will savor the pleasure of taking everything away from you again. Regaining his composure, Naruto sat beside Visenya and took her hand. He could feel a maelstrom of madness and fury running rampant within her. But it's not too late. If only he could get hold of her. Listen to me, Visenya. Whatever that is talking to you in your head, it's not real. Is it not? Visenya slowly turned to him. Her tone came as a twisted singsong. She told me everything. She is not real. Naruto gritted his teeth and cradled her face with his hands, his voice deep and somber. Listen to me, Visenya. Hey, look at me. Whatever that is inside you, you have to fight it. I know you're scared and scared. A ghost of a smirk played about Visenya's wine red lips. I don't feel anything. On the contrary, why do I smell fear from you? Things were starting to make sense for Naruto. Visenya wasn't possessed. Who would have thought the Targaryens had the accursed blood of Otsutsuki coursing through their veins? In a twist of fate, Visenya was the perfect vessel for Kagaya, the madwoman whose insatiable appetite for violence almost broke the world. What good is power if you can't protect the ones you love? I told you, have I not? Visenya's grin widened, I will have such revenge on you. A blood-curdling chill crawled up his spine. Hanada, nay, 
Kagaya had said the same thing to him after she murdered his children. In the midst of his mad fury, he had killed the woman who loved him unconditionally. Ever since that night, he thought of a thousand what ifs. Could he have purged Kaguya's evil from Hinata without killing her? Was there something he could do to avert that disaster? A terrible weight compressed his chest, ensnaring him ever since. There was a time when he fell into the most terrible of human traps and was blinded by the grandeur of his power. At the pinnacle of his career as Hokage, countries would surrender if they made him their enemy. Army would lose their morale and flee if they encountered him in the battlefield. With all the ungodly powers he wielded, he was powerless to save his loved ones. It wasn't Naruto's nature to sulk about what ifs. When he wasn't tending to his dragons, he threw himself into research, hoping to decipher Kaguya's curse. I failed to save Hinata from you once. Naruto growled, his eyes radiated a bright crimson. I won't make that mistake twice. Visenya grinned from ear to ear. The harrowing symphony of the thunderstorm and her mirthless giggles flooded Naruto with consternation. That. It's just fear, he told himself. He had spent too long being afraid, too long being diminished by losses. Too long being everything except what he needed to be. Without hesitation, he pushed her down on her bed, pinned her hands above her head, and ripped her velvet negligee to shreds. Black flames lit up from his fingertips and the whole of Dragon's Keep started to shake. Stay where you belong, Kagaya. Naruto slammed his hand on Visenya's toned stomach. Myriad of black seals etched itself around her navel, startling her in the process. Visenya's beautiful features contorted in agony and she thrashed about like a rabid animal, in my memories. Curse you, Naruto Uzumaki. Visenya clenched her teeth, her voice turned hoarse and menacing. Do you think you have won? No, you? I took inspiration from my father's seal when I devised this. It is no simulacrum of its predecessor, mind you. There is no threshold for its capacity to hold its prisoner. No inflection point where you can spread your disease elsewhere. The seal is sublime. You made Visenya your host. Naruto leaned in. A dark grin flitted across his face. I made her your cage. Your consciousness will be suppressed to the point where it doesn't exist. Hate blazed across Visenya's baleful eyes as she glared daggers at Naruto. Her mouth opened, trying to flounder for words, yet nothing came out. Ah, I see. The seal is working faster than I thought. Caressing Visenya's face, Naruto heaved out a sigh. You know what your greatest mistake is, Kagaya. You always fancy yourself as something, superior. Sadly, you are incapable of moving forward. Stuck in perpetuity from the past. A human mistake. No matter how many times you come back, I will always win. Not because I feel superior, but because I am determined, disciplined, prepared. The writhing stopped. Visenya's face turned placid, yet Naruto could still see Kaguya's futile struggle in her eyes. I designed every inch of Dragon's Keep. Every blade of grass. And when Visenya and Sira found their way here, I prepared contingency plans. To make sure that you will never get your hands on them, like you did my wife and children. Waves of anger rippled through his face, yet his tone was barely audible. Do you really think I will let you, take them from me? White light burst forth from Visenya's eyes as she let out one final scream before her body sagged. X. O. X. O. X. Kill him. It started as soft whispers, seducing her with sweet promises, but it warped into something horrendous. The poisonous voices were like hammers, pounding viciously at Visenya's skull demanding subservience and destruction. The more she resisted, the more relentless those voices became. Still, it was her battle, a fight she must overcome by herself. When she saw Sira and Naruto together, she was heartbroken. Love was not supposed to hurt, but to heal and be the haven from her misery. So why did her chest hurt so much? I, she loved him like a fool. He despises you. That poisonous voice taunted her once more. So why couldn't he acknowledge her? You are nothing more than a slave to him. Did he not know? He knew, but he doesn't care. Was he a fool for not knowing her love for him? Your love is his leverage? Just how much more must she do to make him know? Slit his throat? Make him feel your pain? This fool's love. If you can't have him, then nobody can. As she dashed her hands against the wetness in her eyes, grief overcame her. Perhaps that was why she gave in to the darkness. Are you awake? Visenya's eyes fluttered open, 
awoke to the steady platter of rain upon her window. The sound was a natural lullaby. The voices and throbbing headaches, they were gone. Naruto sat on the side of her bed, grasping her hand and fondling it with his thumb. He had watched her sleep, unwilling to leave her side. All this time, she had been fighting a war all by herself, but her bravery kept her going. Basenya was truly indomitable, not because she wasn't afraid, but because she was unmoved even when the odds were stacked against her. She was not some willowy creatures who sat up in a tower, brushing her hair and waiting for her some night to rescue her. I'm sorry, Basenya. Sorry. Mustering a weak smile, Basenya probed. For what? I didn't know you were carrying this burden all by yourself. If I have been more attentive, then you wouldn't need to suffer. Naruto clenched his fists and gritted his teeth. There was nothing to absolve him from his guilt if something terrible were to happen to Visenya. His stupor was disrupted when Visenya flicked her fingers at his forehead. S. Senya. I know what you're thinking. Visenya sighed and shut her eyes. Don't shoulder the weight of the world on yourself and put on a brave face, master. It's not your fault. I chose to fight Kagaya by myself. Besides, I didn't want you to be worried about me. Naruto averted his gaze. D, did I make you feel that way? Hum, am I that unreliable to you, Senya? All this time, you were fighting this battle alone. You didn't feel the need to consult your problems with me, even when it was killing you. How could you do this to me? Since when did you care about me? Since when have I not care about you? At that, Visenya felt fire burning her cheeks. So, what is she? This, Kagaya Otsutsuki. Naruto's eyes were downcast and morose. A relic of the past, just like me. Many religions gave her different names. The Weeping Woman. The Great Other. The Stranger. The truth is, she is nothing more than a parasite. Ideas, inspirations, and forbidden magic. She has been whispering them in order to feed humans' greed. The first men slaughtered their way into Westeros because of her. The children of the forest inevitably created the long night because of her. The only thing I can do is to seal her away. Eventually, she will still come back. She always comes back. I don't hear her in my head anymore. Good. A small smile curled at Naruto's lips. I have implanted a seal into you. It will notify me if Kagaya is influencing you, but I doubt it will ever occur again. Why didn't you tell me about her? Naruto drew out a long sigh, his eyes heavy with weariness. I had hoped to spare you from her tale. Being immortal, it can be a lifetime of anguish and tragedy. Kagaya and I, we have killed many who were deserving, and many who were not. They say the road to hell is paved with good intention. Well, Kagaya did want to reshape the world for the better. Like you, she saw much suffering in the world and wanted to do something, and look what become of her. I wanted to bury the past, so I chose not to tell you. I wanted you to choose what you wanted to be, not those who have been. Perturbed by ancient lore, Visenya's curiosity got the best of her. Kagaya is feared as a goddess of death, so it seems. What are you then? I want to know the truth. The truth, Naruto tasted the word with stifled disdain. Truth. How he loathed the truth. The truth hadn't set him free, not even in the slightest, but imprisoned him in a cycle of self-hatred. When I found a dragon's keep, I chose to live as a man. But the truth is, like Kagaya, I was born a monster. The only difference between me and her is that I haven't gone mad with power, at least not yet. By the quiver of Naruto's lips, Visenya could discern doubt and trepidation from him. It was as if he believed he might fall to depravity and become the monster he swore to destroy. A monster like Kagaya. My love, you are better, I know it. Am I? Naruto chuckled hollowly. I have learned to close my heart to many things. I have closed my heart to the desperation and suffering of those who lived in Essos. Or Westeros. I refuse to allow myself to feel for them, because they will not feel for me. Selfish, perhaps. But I believe that is the right thing to do. Our powers come with far greater responsibilities. The most difficult of choices required the strongest will. It would be child's play for Naruto to conquer Essos, but he had seen what would become of those who abuse their power. Visenya could understand why Naruto vehemently denied her the opportunity to conquer Essos. The fate of those who slaughter and butcher in the name of justice had always been unkind, something that Naruto did not wish for her. Promise me, Senya. Visenya opened an eye and saw something she had rarely seen. 
A tear had fallen from Naruto's ocean blue eyes. It was at that moment that she saw the fragile side of him, his vulnerability and fears were exposed for her to bear. If there was one thing the mighty dragon warden feared, it was loneliness. Naruto probably never got over losing the ones he loved and cared about. Then again, nobody could really get over something like that. Master? Promise me you will not hide anything from me again. I don't want to lose you. A sweet silence intruded between them as they peered into each other's soul. Words weren't needed to convey their feelings for each other. The past that shackled Naruto had shattered. Man was no island, Naruto mused to himself. We need those who love us. We need those who hate us. We need others to tether us to life, to give us a reason to live, to feel, and to see the light in our darkest days. Say, you haven't really given me a reply, you know? Visenya stifled a giggle. I told you I love you, didn't I? You don't need to reciprocate my feelings. You don't need to refuse me or take any responsibility. But I just want to know. I love you, Senya. Naruto offered her a bright smile. A smile that lit up like the morning sun all the sadness, all the hurt in the past had made this moment all the sweeter, more than anything. It was those words that made Visenya realize how much of a fool she was. She was a warrior princess. He was a hermit. They were never meant to meet, yet life had a way of bringing people together. They fell in love, despite their differences, and once they did, something beautiful was created. X. O. X. O. X power is the crown that eats the head. The Sea Lord of Bravos, Vigo Loridan, was almost choked to death in his own power. After witnessing the terrible magic that the Dragon Warden wielded, he had become a shell of what he once was easily frightened by rolling thunders and dark rooms. His insufferable son was met with a fate worse than death. Stripped from any semblance of sanity, his son was reduced to a catatonic state. Killing him would be mercy. Downing his wine, Vigo slumped into his throne. In Bravos, no entitled locust could become the Sea Lord, for an empire had three stages, savagery, ascendance, and decadence. Bravos was conceived from savagery when the Dragon Warden burned the slave masters and freed the city of bondage. Through hardship, Bravos ascended to great power. However, like all great empires, a pernicious and subversive evil festered within Bravos. It was a cancer. A cancer called decadence. Yosef Loridan was decadence personified, a sloth who paraded his father's glory as his own. The Dragon Warden came, brought fire and fury with him, and eradicated the cancer. Bravasi cheered for the reckoning, and for the sake of his iron reign, he cheered alongside his people. It sickened him, because he traded the prosperity of his empire for the life of his son. My condolence, Lord Loridan. Kornik Zopal straightened himself and offered the Sea Lord a small nod. Your son doesn't deserve his fate. The Dragon Warden must not go unpunished for his crimes. I'm sure you didn't come here to show me sympathy, Kornik. Vigo didn't bother to hide his blanch of disgust at the half-naked boys chained to Kornick's wrist. It's not like you know what sympathy means anyway. Kornick snickered. There is no need to be crude, Lord Loridan. I bear you great gifts. A hundred pieces of gold slabs. I never took you as a charitable man. Surely you didn't sail your way to Bravos just to give me a hundred pieces of gold slabs. Emptiness was living chained by fear. Fear of loss, death, and pain. Vigo saw only emptiness in Kornik's slaves. Those who dared flee would be flogged, those who dared defy would be whipped. The cruelty of men was beyond Vigo's comprehension. What horrible atrocity did those slaves endure? Kornik waved his hand lazily. I heard that the Dragon Warden is no fairy tale. That he is dragons incarnate. A man who can spits fire. A monster who consumes and destroys. Has he not spit fire in your home? Has he not consumed your son and destroyed your life? Watch your tongue, Kornik. You may be the overlord of your city, but you are a mere guest in Bravos. A tense and terrible silence stretched between the two men. Kornik studied Vigo with narrowed eyes, but he knew a raw nerve had been struck. Gods don't come down in our lives to mete out justice for us. Only those with power do it. The Dragon Warden has demonstrated that, has he not? If you are here to borrow my army to sack old Valyria, then you can forget it. Bravos will not strike the home of the Dragon Warden. Have you grown weak and feeble? The Sea Lords of Bravos are brave men. No men are so very frail, weak. Men break and die. 
The Sea Lord is none of that. You're supposed to be a god of war. God of war? It would seem that Kornick knew nothing about the Sea Lord's value. Every Sea Lord would whip the back of their chosen successor with a hunting crop during the inauguration ceremony. Why? To remind themselves that Bravos was purchased with fire and blood and what their forefathers had sacrificed to bestow them such heights. Do not pretend to know what I want, Kornick. Kornick clicked his tongue. All man wants the same thing. Power. Wealth. Women. Are we not enslaved by our own basic instincts, but what's wrong with it? Vigo snorted. In a storm, you don't tie two boats together, they'll drag each other down. Are you implying the odds are stacked against me? Kornick let out a hoarse guffaw. Never tell me the odds. It was not Kornick's wrinkles or weathered face that made Vigo realize how small and foolish he was. Kornick had not seen the monster that he had seen, not felt the terror that he had felt. Perhaps not this day or the next, but one day, when the world came crashing down on Kornick, then he would panic as suicides did when they realized their folly. To wage war against the Dragon Warden was to court death. Heaving out a slow breath, Vigo looked away. No form of persuasion is going to soothe me, Kornick. I will not join you in your crusade. My advice? Abandon this path and go spend the rest of your miserable life with your boy toys. If not, only death awaits you. Kornick weighed Vigo carefully. Have you heard about the story of the jumping fleas? It is no tale from the small folk, mind you. You see, the flea enjoyed jumping to heights unknown, but when a man came and upturned a glass of jar over the flea, it jumped and hit the top of the jar. Time and time again, it would not go any further. And when the man removed the jar, the flea did not jump any higher than it has grown accustomed to. It believed there is a glass ceiling. A hearty laugh escaped Vigo's mouth. And you think I am the flea in your little tail? No, Kornick. The jar was never removed in the first place. The glass ceiling is there and it always will be. What you are after is tantamount to poking a beast with a rusty spear, you old, sleazy cunt. You have no idea what is coming. I have every idea what is coming. Kornick sat a little taller, but his dried lips had stretched thin. Do you now? Vigo snorted. You want to burn down old Valyria and take its treasures? The dragons, I assume? Let me assure you this, Kornick. The stories you heard about the dragon warden, about what he did for Bravos, about what he did to Bravos's enemies, if nothing else, those stories have been watered down. I see. Kornick shook his head and stood up, then do not blame me when I come back and lay waste to Bravos. The treasures and secrets lying in old Valyria will be mine. I will parade the dragon warden's body on the gates of Bravos. And I will rain down every agony, every violation imaginable upon you. When I'm done, you will regret not choosing my side, the winning side. Hot rage almost consumed Vigo as he tossed his goblet at the wall. You are a worm, Kornick. A worm who thought himself a serpent just because you can slither, but that power of yours is not real. You have no idea what you're up against. Parade the dragon warden's body. You are a fool, an old, stupid fool. You have no idea what's coming. Did curiosity kill the cat? No, ignorance did. Kornick laughed aloud and marched out of the Sea Lord's Hall. Even God can die, Lord Loridan. X. O. X. O. X weeks had passed and the colorful flora that painted dragons keep seemed to glow even brighter. The morning fog blanketed the mossy hills, craggy peaks, grassy glens, and even the thick forest that laid like homespun quilts over the foothills. Basenya relished in the cold breeze. It purified her after tending to the herd of sheep on the highland. Did you have a good rest? Sira ambled out of the farmhouse with a bucket of freshly squeezed milk. When she had heard that her lover was possessed, she darted mindlessly into her room and traced kisses on her neck. At nightfall, they would cuddle with each other to sleep. Sira had always been explosive with her emotions, never hiding her concerns behind subtle smiles. It was something Visenya had come to accept and love about Sira. Flicking a lock of hair behind her ear, Visenya sighed, feeling much better. With the menace within her purge, Visenya felt her focus sharpened, her strength rejuvenated, and her will burning. Vagar trotted to her mistress's side, its amber eyes showing her reflection in the ground shuddered as the majestic beast moved. She reached out and stroked the dragon's iridescent scales. How have you been, my dear? Vagar crooned softly, it is about time you tame Madir, Sira. 
For months, Sira had surreptitiously slipped out from home to engage Madir in duels. Each time, she came back beaten and broken, but overexcited as ever. The ruthless Madir saw Sira merely as a hindrance, yet chose not to kill her. Sira knew Madir had acknowledged her conviction, but not her strength yet. She needed to be stronger in order to be worthy, soon, she said. Where's master? Usual place. Sira shrugged and skipped her way back to the mansion. Through the thick boughs of the forest of death lie old Valyria, the ancestral city of spires, fountains, and dreams. Now its ruins had become the nests for a plethora of primordial dragons. Basenya resisted her urge to shudder when she recalled her encounter with the vicious dragon Shigaru Magala when she willfully intruded its nest. The dragon pretended not to notice her when she was hiding in shrubs, only to wheel and pounce at her without warning. The next thing she knew, Shigaru Magala's teeth were inches away from her eyes. When she stared down the stench and darkness of the beast's throat, bile rose to her mouth. It was a sight of death. Apparently, Naruto had caught the dragon's tail with one hand, hurled it over his shoulder, and slammed the beast on solid earth. Shigaru Magala went blood drunk, its rage a thing to move mountains. Needless to say, Naruto beat the dragon down with his bare fists relentlessly and unforgivingly until it rolled over, exposed its belly in submission, and whined pitifully like a puppy. It took an inexplicable trauma to remind Visenya crudely that dragons could never really be tamed. If Vagar were to turn feral, could Visenya discipline her dragon like Naruto did with his? Could she pummel Vagar with hardened eyes and unrestrained strength? Vagar was like a daughter to her. A child who she nurtured and raised. No she could never harm Vagar like that. There must be a way to sedate a dragon's bloodthirsty nature without resorting to violence. After all, violence begets violence. Ready? Visenya almost jolted in fright. Am master? Naruto beamed. Sira told me about her wish. I aim to honor it, so, do you wish to come along with us to Westeros? Wherever you go, I will follow. Visenya looked thoughtful then, but Sira doesn't have a dragon. How is she going to get to Westeros? Are you going to turn into a dragon and let her ride on your back? Did our great and mighty dragon warden just turn into a horse? Naruto gave Visenya's nose a playful squeeze. I'm an irresistible, handsome horse. But no she can take Safira. As if on cue, a dragon with scales of intense blue galloped to Naruto's side. Can Safira fly across the narrow sea? It's a long journey, you know? Naruto stroked the line of Safira's jaw and pressed his forehead against her hard snout. Though Safira descent from a lineage of small dragons, she was blessed with great stamina and gifted at flying. She will do just fine. Get packing, Visenya. We'll leave soon. Gleeful, Visenya coiled her slender arms around Naruto's neck and pulled her into a warm, sensual kiss. If we leave Dragon's Keep, then who is going to guard it? At that, Naruto scoffed. Our purpose as Dragon Wardens is to prevent the dragons from roaming out of this realm, not to prevent invaders from coming in. There is no army in this world that can take Dragon's Keep, so there is no need for us to fret. Hell, I'll give Dragon's Keep to anybody who can conquer it. Then I'll go and pack my armors. Please don't bring your closet with you, it's just a sightseeing trip for us. Visenya winked at Naruto and skipped with jaunty steps to the mansion. X. O. X. O. X. The narrow sea that separated Essos and Westeros was a vast turquoise with briny air. It took the Dragon Wardens a few hours to get across Westeros and they decided to find lodging near Storm's End. As Naruto set foot on the sodden soil of the Stormlands, the brutal rain that battered the coast stopped and the granite clouds parted way for warm rays to seep through. There is a village nearby. We can stay there for tonight. Naruto rubbed Alduin's jaw, earning him a low croon. Letting the world eater near civilization would spell disaster, hence he would have Alduin stay in the woods. Alduin, be a good boy and stay here. We'll come back in the morning. Grunting with annoyance, Alduin merely nodded. Dropping down from Vagar's saddle in a loud thud, Visenya strolled to Naruto, her arm resting on the hilt of her sword. She dressed like she was about to go to war. A battle angel in black steel with the sigil of the dragon warden. A sunglow dragon enveloped by a maelstrom. Emblazoned proudly on her cape. Will it be appropriate for us to leave our dragons here? What if someone were to see them? They will mistake them as the Targaryen's dragons. Sira interjected. Her black cloak billowed along with the wind. 
Besides, there are a herd of deer nearby, so they won't be raising any villages. Gray fog permeated the forest, courtesy of Naruto's magic. Do not meddle with anything you see, stay low. He gave Visenya a look, what, do I look like a nosy person? Sira and Naruto flatly nodded. Hey, Vagar, Safira. Naruto's somber tone caught the two dragons' attention, whom suddenly stood still and tall. How inconceivable, Visenya and Sira mused, that these great beasts of destruction and death were subservient to a mere mortal. Well, Naruto wasn't a mere mortal, but nobody could tell. It amazed Visenya and Sira that dragons were instinctively fearful of Naruto, like gazelle would to a lion. Legends foretold that the dragon warden was something beyond monstrous. Could it be that dragons were able to perceive Naruto's true form? Keep an eye on Alduin. Make sure he behaves. At that, Alduin grunted his disapproval, but mellowed when Vagar snapped at him. It wasn't a secret that Alduin had been trying to court Vagar for years but to no avail. Naruto, Visenya, and Sira hiked over a rolling hill and spotted a tired, old town. Bony mules scampered away and hid under sweltering shade of tall trees when they caught Naruto's eyes. From afar, they could see the outline of Storm's End, a formidable castle that was built to withstand the rage of the moonlit sea. If Visenya's memories served her right, her half-brother, Ori's Baratheon, was the lord paramount of the Stormlands. How many years had it been since she last saw him? Abruptly, the wail of a woman tore through the air, catching Visenya's attention. Righteous fury burned within her when she saw a haggard woman being dragged through mud by four brutes. It didn't take a genius to figure out that they were about to hang her. Don't think about it, Naruto chided, his attention was on the road ahead. But, we don't meddle. Though the disgust and stifled fury in Naruto's eyes were evident, he chose to be indifferent. Help me, the disgruntled woman yelped horribly as they kicked her in the gut. Evil was evil. Lesser, greater it made no difference to Visenya. The world was festered with malevolence, not because it harbored those who were evil, but because there were people who wouldn't do anything about it. If Visenya were to choose between one evil and another, she rather not choose at all. Whipping out the dagger from her boot, Visenya stormed towards the commotion. Should we stop her? Sira grinned. Truth be told, Visenya became unyielding and headstrong when she was on a warpath. Some might call her sanctimonious or even self-righteous, but when things went south, she wasn't the type of person to sit idly by. Naruto clicked his tongue in disapproval and folded his arms. There was no stopping Visenya now. Make it quick, Senya. Visenya twirled her dagger with her finger, her eyes fixated at the man who wore the emblem of the Baratheon, the stag on his chest plate. Ori's Baratheon was many things. A man of honor, pride, and loyalty. Once upon a time, under a starry night, he told her that he could never fathom the idea of siring a bastard, because he didn't want any children in this world to feel the way he did. Could her half-brother condone such unjust in his land? What crime did she commit for her to be treated as such? One of the knights turned, his face was weathered by wind and sun, mind your own business, tramp. Please, it wasn't me, the woman begged through hoarse voice. Shut thee up, you whore. Visenya felt her blood boiled and her hand trembling in rage. Only murder and treason constitute the need for an execution. Was she a spy from foreign lands or was she a murderer? A lanky man stood forward, his dirty brown hair was salted with grey. She murdered her husband, how does that sound for ye? No, the woman cried on her knees. They raped me in my own home and murdered my husband. Please, I. I said shut thee up. They kicked her so hard that she threw up blood. There comes a time when doing the right thing rises above duty. Visenya closed her eyes, this was such time. I shall give you two choices. Swear on your honor that you will atone for your sins and serve her till her last. Or I shall execute you with my bare hands. Choose. The cantankerous knights exchanged glances at each other before they broke into a fit of laughter. One of them imitated Visenya in a high-pitched voice. Swear on your honor or I execute you. Ha. Are ya gonna poke us with that toy knife? Pitiful. The matter of fact was that people enjoyed cooking up stories of monsters, which made them seem less monstrous themselves. When they cheated, stole, beat their wives, raped a woman in her own house, starved an old man, or killed blindly, they liked to think that bears entering huts at daybreak was more monstrous than they were. 
they felt easier to live. Visenya gave up being civil to a bunch of remorseless animals. She gave the woman a cold stare. Close your eyes. Things escalated too fast for anybody to process. In split seconds, Visenya threw her dagger right into the lanky knight's right eye. She didn't even spare them the chance to react, for she had morphed into a thunderbolt and closed up the distance between them. With a swift roundhouse kick, Visenya lopped off one of the knight's head. The last two men were about to draw their swords, but it was already too late. With Herculean strength, Visenya lifted those two men by their neck, her eyes aglow. Frost, like a disease, started to spread around their necks and turning their skin blue. She could see their lives slowly fading away from their eyes. I pity you lot, for your father has not taught you the grace of power unused, and mother for not teaching you the joy of power used well. I, Visenya Targaryen, Dragon Warden and Conqueror of Westeros, sentence you to die. Their legs were kicking in the air, but their struggle soon ceased and their bodies sagged. When Visenya dropped their cold corpses, they shattered into red blocks of ice. Plucking out her dagger from the eye socket of the dead, lanky man, Visenya puffed out a sigh. I cannot undo what they did to you, but I have given you the justice you deserve. What you do from now on is up to you to decide. With that, Visenya spun around and walked back to Naruto and Sira. Having fun yet? Sira teased. I'm just doing what should have been done. Frankly, Visenya was expecting to receive an earful from Naruto, but nothing came. He simply flashed her a warm smile and patted her head. Keep this up and you might just be called Visenya the busybody. At that, Sira choked in her giggle, much to Visenya's annoyance. It surprised Visenya and Sira when their impassive master strolled to the downtrodden woman and handed her a pouch of gold dragons. Perhaps they had mistaken his neutrality for apathy. The trip to the old town was a short one. It wasn't as colorful as Visenya thought or as lively as Sira would have hoped for. Peasants waddled in and out of stores. Nobody was in a hurry, because there was nowhere else to go, nothing special to buy, and nothing to see. Most of the inns were either dilapidated or a facade for a whorehouse, something that displeased Visenya and Sira. If only women were given proper education and apprenticeship, then they wouldn't need to sell themselves like that. Sira could only look away with a heavy heart. They eventually found a decent lodging with whitewashed walls. I'll go in first. Let's try not to kill any more people. Unless necessary. Visenya quipped. Naruto stood in front of Old Stag's Inn listening to the hubbub of voices. Too many unwanted eyes, he thought. As he sauntered into the tavern, the innkeeper raised his head above a barrel of pickled cubers and measured him with a gaze of disdain. Those who venture near the outskirt of Storm's End were either sellswords or bandits, neither one was pleasant company to say the least. What do you want? Three pints of fresh ale. Aye. The innkeeper wiped his hands on his apron, filled the tankards, and placed them on the counter. It was then he noticed two beautiful blondes in armor and cloak standing beside the enigmatic man. Targaryens, the innkeeper presumed. Ye from King's Landing? Naruto blinked. No but I am looking for a room for the night. There's none, grunted the innkeeper. I'm afraid ye have to ask elsewhere. We will prefer to stay here. Are ye deaf? A pockmarked man who, from the moment Naruto had entered had not taken his gloomy eyes from him, got up and approached the counter. Five of his companions rose behind him, each fingering the truncheons on their waist. I wonder why are there two lost, Targaryen beauties roaming in this back of the woods. How about you come with us and we can show you a good time? Visenya sneered. Leave us be, insect. Ah, don't be hasty, milady, rasped the pockmarked man, his breath reeked of garlic and anger. When we're done with you, ye'll beg for more. A chortle broke out amongst the band of vagabonds, much to Visenya and Sarah's disgust. One of the men reached out to Sira, but she was faster. In a blink of an eye, Sira grabbed his hand and snapped his fingers like twigs. It didn't end yet, for Sarah's fingers were like a viper, striking his throat and shattering his trachea. Blood gushed out from his mouth as he fumbled his hands at his ruined neck, choking out a horrid death rattle before he collapsed like a ragdoll. The pockmarked man's face contorted. Your pay for that, bitch. Dark Sister hissed in its sheath and shone briefly in the dim light. The tavern seethed in chaos. There was a high pitched scream, and one of the few remaining customers tumbled toward the exit. A chair fell with a crash, and earthenware smacked hollowly against the aged floor, 
and silence intruded. The innkeeper trembled as he stared at the horribly slashed face of the pockmarked man, who was clinging with his fingers to the edge of the counter and was slowly sinking from sight. More outlaws poured in with their crossbows held high, roaring for mayhem. Sira drew Brightroar, the blade traced a glistening arc from her hip. When the bowstrings hummed, Sira and Visenya's swords flashed, and the barrage of bolts flew upward with a metallic whine, spinning in the air until it clattered against the roof. Terror, like cold mud, was clear on the bandits' faces, paralyzing limbs and blocking throats. T they deflected it? Sira vanished into a black blur, darting towards three goons from the right. In an instance, she had slashed one across the chest, the other in the temple, and the beheaded the last fool, leaving them to hobble backwards and fall limply to the floor. Lusting for blood and battle, Visenya pounced at her enemies, severing their tendons above their elbows and knees so she could relish in their screams. Beg for mercy. Beg, and I might consider sparing your pathetic lives. F you. One of them spat. How unwise. Visenya swung her sword and five heads dropped. Naruto placed a few gold dragons on the counter and offered the innkeeper a small smile. I assume you have a room for us now, no? These should cover all the broken furniture in your labor. Am my labor? Well, it won't be sanitary to keep the corpses here all day. Go dig some graves for them. It's the least you can do. Taking a quick glance at Ravaged Tavern, the innkeeper spotted a few bodies still convulsing in a dark, spreading puddle. Stifling a shudder, the innkeeper caught his breath and vomited. Just what in the world were these women? They were monsters. W what are you? Naruto paused for a moment scrutinizing the innkeeper with a cold gaze. If anybody asks, tell them the Dragon Wardens have arrived to Westeros. The end. Remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next video.